Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 146 of the American Muslim Experience, and we are back and joined by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Salaikum Perez <laughs> and Salaikum listeners. It's glad to be back. It's definitely been a while. We're, we were a little rusty here uh, getting started on the setup and everything. I literally had to uh, take a moment and pause and think about what the usual intro is that I do. So, yeah, it, it has been a while. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I think... Uh, and a lot has happened. Yeah, so There's Mabruk, little... you did Umrah Thank with you. the family. That's exciting. It was really, yeah, it was, we, were, we, were, we were just blessed every, every, every part of the trip. And, uh, yeah, we started in Mecca and then went to Medina and then we were in Cairo and in Egypt, uh, broader Egypt, for about two weeks. Mm. Um, I know we'll be getting to Egypt today with our yeah. guest. We have a guest who's uh, joining us. I think this may be the first husband-wife duo we've had on the show. So we've had his wife on the show prior to this. So please, that's, uh, that's Omar, right. yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so a little about Sheikh Jamal Diwan. He was born and raised in Southern California to parents from Newfoundland and Pakistan. That, that's we'll, We're going to dive into that. He accepted Islam in 2003 while at UCSD. Uh, for those of you non-Californians, that's, a, that's UC San Diego. After getting married and graduating from US, UCSD in Third World Studies, he and his wife moved to Egypt to study Arabic Islamic studies. He stayed there for the better part of the next seven years, finishing up an undergrad degree in Sharia from Al-Azhar. During that time, he also completed two years of grad work in Islamic studies from the American University in Cairo. In addition to his formal studies, he's obtained ijazat uh, to, in various branches of Islamic studies such as aqidah, fiqh, tazkiyah, and hadith. Upon re uh, returning from Egypt in 2011 back to the U.S., he has served as a religious teacher and instructor in Southern California in various capacities such as resident scholar, university chaplain, and Islamic studies teacher. He co-founded the Majlis with his wife, Sheikha Muslima Permal, uh, who we've, as Barbara has mentioned, had, had on the show. The, the Majlis seeks to nurture safe community spaces where people can learn and live Islam based on the traditional sources of understanding the faith while acknowledging the particular challenges of the American context. It focuses its efforts on religious education, spiritual refinement, love, and service. Sheikh Jamal is the father of two, residing in Southern California with his family. Welcome, Sheikh Jamal. Good to see you again. Alhamdulillah. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and welcome back to the Bay Area. And so we are recording here at the uh, Muslim Community Center in the East Bay. And so we're blessed to have you visit our, our community. I know you and I were talking off mic. These episodes tend to be biographical, so I have a bio in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I was I was positing that perhaps it gives our listeners at least kind of a roadmap of where the conversation may or may not go. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one way to look at it, I think. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, at, at times it can be a little uh, redundant. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, welcome. That's, welcome that's to the show. Thank, Thank you. And, Thank and you we were just chatting. Yeah. We were just chatting about... Um, some other folks in in the in the uh, area who were half Pakistani and then half something else very interesting and uh, and I just realized wow uh, you're in you're in the same boat because um, yeah. I, I, I think we were before you know before we had met you a couple years ago yeah. uh, we were wondering is you know is he a convert is he the the last name sounds 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 very uh, Pakistani or Arab ethnic but uh, we were trying to figure all that out but that uh, and then I I was convinced that that Sheikha Muslima was the convert because her name is like Muslima like which is not a very common name yeah. that you hear but of course she is born Muslim um, but both of you are. Um, although your your own journey is obviously unique to you, and I think it's a great way to place to pick up, which uh -huh. is kind of being born and raised in Southern California, uh, diverging ethnic backgrounds, how that was like. I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, I basically grew up white. So <laughs> in terms of how people understood me and how I more or less interacted with the world, my dad came here really early. He came in 66 and, you know, eventually he married my mom and they just kind of did their thing. So it, the Pakistan piece was not a big part of who we were growing up at all. Okay. It, it, you know, Pakistani culture, Pakistani food, Urdu language, none of this stuff was a part of anything that we did. I think the first time I really got any flavor of that was probably in high school. It's like the first time I had Pakistani food or something. What about you know? what about like extended family yeah. uh, or never, anything like that? Never saw my dad's side of the family except maybe a handful of times. Mm. You know, a handful of times someone came because most of them were in Pakistan. So to come all the way to California is a 
they don't have any reason to come here. Mm. And uh, have you been at all? No, no. So there were a handful of times someone came, yeah. and, I, th- and that was memorable. And I remember thinking like, oh, so they, and I would see them pray in the room. And I thought that was like a really interesting thing, you know, and stuff like that. But it wasn't, it was very distant. You mentioned the Pakistan piece being sort of distant or absent. And you sort of alluded to it just now. Uh, the religious piece then also, Islam. It's absent. Absent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was basically nothing. There was once or twice my dad wanted me to go to Eid prayer with him. He would often, every so often he would go to Eid prayer. You know, that was where he might come. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a wonderful man. You know, uh, so much of my life is indebted to my parents. So I, I don't want anything to be misunderstood. Sure. Um, but, you know, that wasn't his thing really. Right. And um, so once or twice he wanted me to go to Eid prayer with him and I kind of refused. <laughs> I was just like a kid, you know. Right. I was like, "What do I? Why would I do that? I, you know, I don't, I don't know how to pray. I don't know any of this stuff. I knew they, I knew Muslims fasted. So when I said I don't know what I'm doing, I don't want to go and stuff like that, he was like, "Well, they're gonna have a bunch of food," and I was like, "Well, they've been fasting all month. They need a bunch of food. I haven't been doing that. Like, I don't need the food, you know." <laughs> so we had that little argument, yeah. and then. You know, right, even t- you even turned down the food. That usually that's, that's yeah. The even one the thing food, that the kids I was like, go for. Yeah. it was funny, you know. I was kind of like, well, I don't need the food. They need the food. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about how about mom's side? Mom's side, we used to see every so often, but okay. again, they weren't here. And you know, religiously, she, like background? religiously, I mean, Christ- about I mean, as nominal, Christian, nominal about Christian. as Christian as my dad is. Dad is Muslim. You know? They're not, not like they're not super into uh, organized religion, I guess you can say, or these Understood. kind of things, but. My mom's family, we we would see them. Like okay. every couple of years, we'd go to Newfoundland. We'd spend the summer there. There was one summer where they sent myself and my sister. I have a younger sister to spend six weeks there by ourselves with our relatives and stuff like that. So there were some mem- memorable uh, experiences around that. Have you traced the family back further, like before Newfoundland? I mean, I yeah, European, I mean, it's, but... Newfoundland's mostly Irish, British, oh, right, more or less. You know, I so in the any test that we've done, I did one, my sister did one, we got different results, and that's probably its own conversation. But <laughs> pretty much, Newfoundland is like Irish and British. Got and it. then my my dad is actually Maimon from the from the Pakistan side, so yeah. he's uh, that's clear. <laughs> And and what what sort of um, what sort of things were you into? Uh, you've, I think you've mentioned in the past basketball. Yeah. Uh, tell Basically me about basketball. I mean, where we grew up was close to the ocean, mm. so South Bay. Um, you know, like beach city, South Bay city. Torrance was the city. So, you know, basically basketball and the beach. You know, and, I, and this is just probably more for me, but I imagine some listeners as well who would be interested in this. But I the. Um, each city has its own unique geographic flavor and so on. And certainly I imagine the greater Los Angeles area or what we commonly refer to colloquially as SoCal in general has its own flavor. So when, you know, you mentioned South Bay, um, Mm -hmm. South Bay means something very different here in the Bay area, Mm -hmm. but I imagine obviously in SoCal, it means something very different. So if you could, as, as a native, kind of give us a, give us kind of a topography, (laughs) if you will. Oh man. Uh, Do you mind? I mean, (laughs) this is probably more for me because again, something we were talking about off mic, when, when people who don't live in California or when they visit for the yeah. first time, right, we were talking about this, the image you have of California before you come here, either as to visit or to live, is basically Southern California. That's what right. you're imagining. Right. Uh, beach boys, sun, you know, surfing, all that stuff, yeah. right? I mean, again, there's probably other things. Uh, although your reference is a bit dated, the beach boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> no, right? You know, no, but, but you're right, you're right. I mean, there's probably a whole hip hop element I'm missing. For but sure. that's what people think about when they think about California or Cali. Uh, let, let, let's say Compton, let's say, you know, obviously Los Angeles, uh, East LA, if uh, mm-hmm. you want to talk about another dated reference, yeah. uh, born in East LA, if you mm-hmm. all remember that 80s song slash movie. Um, but anyway, so if you could just maybe give us kind of like a cultural topography of SoCal. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. Um, very well that's why you question. come here right for the interesting yeah, question and that's i was, I was really also thinking uh, aside from the, yeah. the culture to, i was thinking if you mentioned basketball mm-hmm. i'm thinking you're at the peak of like the kobe shack oh, days but that's yeah. a, no no you can, you can tell us as much about that as as, as you want i'm more like actually showtime era 
Oh, so, oh. because I'm from like from five years old, basketball was life. Got it. Love and it. And my dad, when he came to LA, he was before he got into he he spent most of his career in uh, aerospace management. Mm. But before that, he was in hotel management, and he was the manager of this hotel that was close to the airport. And any athletes and stuff, they would stay there. It was like the major hotel at that point. So nice. he got really into sports and everything early on. Uh, so basketball and the Lakers especially was was life, you know. And I'm early 80s, born in the early 80s. So that was like the Magic Johnson era. The Magic Johnson sure. coming out with HIV was like a, a major incident in my childhood, you know. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, that. Right. So... Anyways, LA, I mean, I don't think that I'm probably the best equipped to do this, but I'm thinking about it right now as you're saying it. There's definitely certain cultural tendencies to different parts of LA. Right. Uh, downtown has its own, downtown and what's around it has its own thing. And then you have West LA. Uh, maybe this is, a, yeah, this is a good place to start. So you have downtown, it has its culture. Uh -huh. right? used to be now people live in downtown it used to be that people didn't live in downtown right. but you have the garment you have the garment district you have the fashion district the financial district you have these things and then if you go west that's kind of like rich busy la <laughs> so that's yeah. santa, like santa monica, monica yeah. yeah santa monica yeah. west la if you're a little bit north but west is like westwood and ucla yeah. and that area okay you know it okay. has its own flavor yeah. downtown would be usc has its own flavor Downtown is, uh, so USC like just, is part of downtown. Just south, okay. I mean, USC is South LA. You're starting to get, yeah, okay, so, south. Uh, so then you get South LA, South Central, that they don't call it South Central anymore, they call it South LA, you know, marketing. And then uh, you have East LA has its kind of like Hispanic, Chicano flavor going on in East LA historically. I don't know what the situation is today. I would imagine it's still kind of like that. If you get down left a little bit more, like Southwest a little bit more, you start to get into the beach cities. I see. So, like, as you're moving there, you hit you hit the airport, you hit Westchester, and then you start to move south to El Segundo, to Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, Palos Verdes, runs along the yeah. coast. And then in from those, you have their, like, transition, you know. I, you left have, my, I, I once left my wallet in El Segundo. Yeah. <laughs> and, did you, and did you meet a tribe there? A tribe called Quest? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you got the reference. Yeah, okay. So, so then you move, yeah. you know you move in so there's there's Inglewood, there's Hawthorne, there's these are kind of like Carson, they all okay. are a step in. And so I think you kind of know LA by the freeways too. Hmm. Like what's west of the 405? It's what's, not just an SNL skit. People no, I mean, the really, freeways are really, West of the 405 is one thing. Between the 405 and the 5 is another thing. It's a very East unique. of the 5 is another thing. Below above the 105 is one thing, below the 105 is one thing. Below the 91 above the 91. So it's it's interesting like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Torrance is kind of like in between the beach cities and the I wouldn't call them inner cities, but like they're okay. a little bit more in. Right. So like Torrance sits between for the most part, Redondo Beach and Carson. And that's where you grew up, Torrance? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's like surrounded by Redondo Beach, uh, Carson, Gardena on one side, and then kind of like San Pedro and Palos Verdes on the other side. Uh, and then the OC is its own. The OC is its own thing. Right. Yeah. After you go a little bit south, more further than Palos Verdes and, and, and San Pedro, then you'll get into Long Beach. After you cross through Long Beach, you get into OC. You, you know, you know yeah. this topography exercise here. Imagine if we did it about the Muslim community in whether it's LA or even across the US. It'd be a very interesting conversation, really maybe interesting, for a, a time, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, w what is the Muslim community like in each of these areas? Mm -hmm. What are the kind of the the trends or whatever? Mm -hmm. That'd be a very interesting conversation. Yeah. No. Community is always affected by the city. That it is, and the, the city always is... has its culture based on where it is and its topography and everything else. Right. So it's really it's an interesting thing to think about. Right. Inshallah. Just because I know we were going to be delving into your background. So I, I, I you know, I, I wanted to go there because I think you're, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that it, so much of the flavor of our own unique communities are informed by, uh, the, you know, the, the area, the region, you know, whether it's culturally, politically, socially, where we live. So uh, I think it's, yeah. And, and again, Southern California being such a, a, a pivotal sort of point on the map in terms of Muslim communal life, broader, even 
speaking broadly outside of uh, just Southern California, uh, the influence it's had and it's the community has had on the broader, I think, Muslim community in America. We didn't mention like Muslim community touch points, as it were. But, um, you know, you have um, the uh, Islamic Center of Southern California. That's unique. You have Islamic Center of Orange County, mm -hmm. where we recorded with Dr. Muslim mm -hmm. Siddiqui. Okay. You have, you know, communities in L.A. You have the Majlis now, uh, which we'll definitely get to. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm missing a lot. But, you know, those yeah. are they uh, and some of those places that I mentioned have had broader uh, influence even beyond Southern California. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and, oh, for sure. And I, I lived briefly in, in Orange County. In 2011, 12. Actually, I was mentioning before the show that that's when I first saw you doing a chutbah in, in yeah. ICOI, or, uh, Irvine. the Irvine Masjid, uh, early 2012. But yeah, it's it's you're bring you're just talking about that is bring back some memories right. and and it's so different. It was such a different experiencing brief experience moving briefly down there from the mm -hmm. Bay Area. It was like such a different experience, yeah, right? right. The, I was actually I was talking to one of the brothers about that yesterday. That the people think California is California. California is very different. Mm -hmm. The Bay is very different than Greater LA. San Diego actually is very different than LA and OC. Yep. Um, so and then you know. there's whole Central Valley. And then of course, and there's the Central Valley. Inland there's, Empire. I mean, there's those north are... of the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of space north of the Bay Area. People forget. You people know? do forget. <laughs> Who lives in Eureka? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I I, I agree. Uh, but no, it, like to my point about like, and I know we'll get to this because you also, like me, come of age in 90s Islam in America or the Muslim community and what was happening. But, you know, figures like the Hatud brothers, Allah mm -hmm. Yarham, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Siddiqui, Hafizullah. I mean, these people, you know, these were national figures. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's others that I'm forgetting right They're now. Legends. But Dr. Fatih Osman, Dr. Dr. Ahmed Sakhir. Dr. Ahmed Sakhir, right now. Uh, Fatih Osman, uh, Osman these were uh, yeah. also from Southern California. So, you know, these were people who had, uh, again, like I said, shaped national discourse. So, um, which is why, again, LA is always sort of fascinated um, mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get back to basketball and sort of your background. And, <laughs> but before we do, it's, it's funny, you know, I, uh, I, unlike Omar, I, I came into basketball much later uh, in terms of like growing up. I, I have, you know, you have BC in the common era. For me, my demarcation point is before India and after India. Because mm. I actually, even though I was born and raised in the United States, as you know, mm -hmm. Omar, right in middle school, my family went overseas. We mm -hmm. lived in India for about two and a half years. And that mm -hmm. was a, one because of where, I mean, I was 13, mm -hmm. 14, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, but that was a pivotal and a monumental sort of moment in my life. And so that's mm -hmm. why I always sort of, for me, it's always like, okay, before India, this mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. was prevented. And this is post India. So when I came mm -hmm. back from India in high school is when I got into basketball. Mm -hmm. And like Sheikh Jamal, uh, my, the team that I gravitated, gravitated towards was Showtime, oh, LA, Showtime, of LA the Lakers. 80s. People don't know. And I mean, and I and I say that because I, I know I have a whole uh, swath of people in Houston who are listening and calling me a sellout right now. Yeah. But hey, I didn't grow up. You know, I didn't grow up a Rockets fan until. <laughs> you know, the 90s. Yeah. Uh, that was later. But my earliest sort of infatuation with basketball was um, the late 80s. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. the Bad Boys in Detroit, and it was the mm -hmm. Lakers. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm, I'm actually in the same boat. We could talk about this for hours. Because I, I talk about Hakeem Olajuwon you do. so much. Yeah. But my very first Muslim role model was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I mm -hmm. remember, I, I can tell you the minute I it was it was like literally the the 1988 finals Me game too. six Kareem hitting the free throws so we could talk we could geek out about yeah. that um, but nope. yeah absolutely it was like monumental for me as a 11 year old back then to see like Kareem Abdul Jabbar on the back of a jersey on the on the best team in the exactly. country mm -hmm. that's absolutely. funny because, and then that because, moment where he in the locker room says you know when they won the championship I think he said Allahu Akbar or something right I just remember that being such a moment in my life you know see, I have no recollection of any of that. <laughs> Because it wasn't like Islam didn't matter to me. Yeah, interesting, yeah it's really yeah, funny. Yeah. It's just interesting to think about that. So we're experiencing we two different, the same thing, the same yeah. different, thing in different the uh, lenses. Impact. Yeah, really yeah, amazing. fascinating. Really interesting. But uh, anyway, yeah. So I guess yeah, life growing up in in Torrance then. Yeah, yeah. Basketball was kind of life. Yeah, basketball was life. I mean, alhamdulillah, my my you know my parents they provided a very comfortable upbringing for us. I think Torrance was especially where we were in Torrance at that time uh, was a little bit less gentrified than it is now. Um, so people were comfortable and then it was a little bit more diverse than it is now maybe. Um, but yeah, it's interesting about the, the layout of the city because now that I'm thinking about it, it really, I'm, I was kind of between two worlds and I think Torrance is kind of like that. 
Mm. I was between the world of the beach cities and that culture and going to the beach and, you know, everything that you do at the beach and that whole, it has its own flavor. And then at the same time, if you go the other direction, you're in the city. And so I'm always between the beach and everything that's related to that and basketball and hip hop and like that whole thing, kind of more city side. And, um, but alhamdulillah, you know, we grew up just living life and parents, you know, living our day to day, doing basketball, going to school. You know, it was always expected that we got straight A's. You know, it was, we were consistent in that part uh, with the immigrant experience. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was definitely expected you bring home straight A's. And uh, we just played basketball. And that was pretty much it. Um, until I graduated high school and I went to UCSD. Okay. Then that's that's kind of like that turning point. Have you done a dive enough in, in your own sort of on, on your dad's side specifically into understanding what sort of mem and culture means? You know, what it means to be a Memon? You know, it's really funny because yeah. I didn't even know I was until another brother that I was studying with overseas told me. He was Memon. Interesting. So, and, and at that time, it was hard to get money overseas and stuff. It's, things were different than it is now. So, he had met my dad to my dad to, to give him some money so he can bring to us in Egypt. And when they met, he was like, he realized that my dad is Memon. And he's the one who told me. He came to Egypt. He gave me the money. He's like, you know, you're Maimon, right? I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Interesting. And then as as people began to talk to me more about it and stuff like that, <laughs> I started to understand my dad better. You know, yeah. like, oh, subhanAllah. And now I understand. And he's like, always wanted, always talking about getting into business, always worried about issues of finance, always, you know, like all the stereotypes that you would hear uh, is, I, I mean, in my experience in the home was very true. Yeah. You know, that, and, and it, made, it made me understand my dad a lot better. Mm. I feel like a lot of those things I opened up for me more when I met Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah, which is a little bit of a jump, but he's someone who helped me to understand my history more. Even my mom, because I always just understood my mom as a white lady in the context of someone who's being raised in America. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realize that she's not a white American. There's she's more. She's a white lady from Newfoundland, Canada, which has its own culture, has its own history. Has its, yeah. It's not white America. And yeah. it's a very different place. And so that really gave me like a deeper appreciation of, of who she is and what she, yeah. I mean, of course, we always love our family and stuff, but learning to understand that deeper and deeper and get a, it, was, it was really been a gift. So right. a little bit, I've explored it a little bit. No, you, and I, it doesn't fall on deaf ears for me when you say, or you, when you attribute that to Dr. Omar, because mm -hmm. I mean, in my own ways, I, I've come to appreciate aspects of my culture, you know, through conversations that I've had, or I've been fortunate mm -hmm. to have with Dr. Omar. So, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to him, inshallah. Yeah. After the law, yeah. but um, yeah, I want to I want to yeah. ask about the college experience yeah. now. So, you, you you mentioned you essentially grew up, you know, white in your right as is kind of more, how, yeah. more or less right culturally speaking, culturally right? Speaking. Californian, like just a typical yeah. Californian kid, right? Yeah. Um, but you go to college, and presumably that's where you first ex meet Muslims for the first mm -hmm. time, get exposed to this. I love you. Tell us about that. But I almost want to dive into if, if your perspective about what is it when kids go off to college that potentially uh, inspires them to go through that spiritual awakening. And I ask this as a parent of mm. a 16 year old who's, you know, potentially going off for college soon. Um, mm. I'm really, in, I'm curious about your experience. And then if you can comment on like the psyche of a typical 18 or whatever, 18, 19 year old at that time and tie that into your experience, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a tall order. Yeah. Um, I think one would be to say maybe, and, and maybe you can agree or disagree, but there is no such thing as a typical 18-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. Yeah. There might be certain tendencies. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But I'm saying there's so much more happening. I ask, yeah. I'm yeah. asking that yeah. because I've yeah. seen kids, when kids yeah. go off to college at 18, especially like Muslim kids whose parents let them, first of all, are they are in that batch who, who they're allowed to go live right. off college? There's really two paths they take. You're right. Yeah. Either they go double down on their faith, even if they're kind of <clears throat> not really into it beforehand, if they meet the right people, it, it becomes a real um, yeah. uh, a thing, identity for them at that yeah. point. They really double, triple down, and, and, or, you know, they, they go, go the other way. route and yeah. they basically be like, okay, I'm going to, you know, yeah. forget all that. Whatever, whatever, whatever little I had in the home, like, it's, I'm taking that thought off, right? Yeah. Well, I think for sure if you leave home, it's going to be more pronounced than if you don't leave home. 
But either way, uh, anecdotally, I think there might be some research on this too. It seems like 19 is nineteen twenty is a really big transition age anyways. Mm. And a lot of people just talking to people, oh, when did you become Muslim? 19 seems like, like I was 19. And 19 seems like it's it always repeats itself. Mm. And I think there's something to that. I think that when we... When you're living in your own home, even if in college, and we'll get to it, some people live in their own home, they still go to college and they still have changes, right? But I think that when you go to college is really the first time where you're deeply exposed to other people's ways of doing things. Hmm. Like yeah. For the most part, before that, it's like your family's way of doing things is the way that you do things, and that's your world, and you just kind of assume, even if we don't explicitly do that we assume that that's what it is for everyone else too and then now i'm going into this experience i'm leaving my home you know i was it was about two hours away san diego from where i grew up so i'm going into this place i'm moving into this dorm which i don't i mean people might get upset with me on this but i don't recommend muslims live in dorms ever you know it's it's just uh, and especially now with all this gender stuff and i don't want to get off in too many tangents but things can get really tricky very quickly i've had some cases recently where i'm like wow subhanallah i never considered that mm. you know like maybe they're in oftentimes the dorms are split by gender but then what if someone decides to change their gender and that's your roommate <laughs> what do you do you know it's a very tricky situation but anyways i was in these dorms and like i don't know i i always say i had at least seven or eight direct neighbors that used to get high like five times a day on campus mm. so like you're in this whole new thing nobody's watching you nobody's doing anything for you you're handling your food you're handling your life you're, you have to go to classes on your own so talking to people about conversations you never had before it's just a whole lot of newness and i think that that gets a lot of people to question just what they do and why. Yeah, I, I don't think that I did that initially. I think that my first year of college, I really screwed up. And I made a lot of mistakes. And I think that's what kind of got me to think, all right, maybe this route that you're going on is not the best route. And uh, at the same time, I, got, I had like a roommate who introduced me to the underground hip hop scene. And also the autobiography of Malcolm X came up like in the same kind of thread. And around that time, also, I started to meet Muslims on campus. So, like, a lot of pieces came together at the same time for me. Mm. But um, what even triggered the interest? Um, I know the movie, the Malcolm X movie was out around that time. But but what what else was it? Was it hip-hop? hip-hop what really pushed you into Hip-hop, for discover? sure. Yeah. I think hip-hop and, like, underground hip-hop and trying to find some sort of identity between all these different experiences. And that was 2003, early, uh, late 2002, early 2003. So we're really close to 9-11 and like that mm. whole experience is fresh. Um, and I don't know, I just, all those pieces like pushed me. I had a copy of the Quran in English because in high school, one guy that I went to high school with had given it to me. He had told me, he said, look, I know you don't care about this stuff, but your family's Muslim. You should have this. And he gave me this, subhanAllah, he gave me this English translation of the Quran. That's the one I read, actually. Mm. When I started to like want to know about Islam, that's the one that I read. And, uh, you know, all of those things. I also had a class in, um, it was like a GE class that did world religions and history of the world and stuff like that, that forced us to kind of go through different religions also. So all of these things kind of happen at the same time, you know. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And then, uh, so like Omar mentioned, n you're interacting maybe for the first time in, in, in a real meaningful way with Muslims now or, or a, vib a vibrant Muslim community on campus that obviously includes the MSA or maybe it's not obvious, but I mean. Yeah. It MSA was the MSA. great. We had a great MSA. Okay. Yeah, so you just decide MSA. basically like, okay, like ha what, what, what was it that it actually It was funny because I, 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 the Malcolm X thing was there. Mm-hmm. And the hip hop thing was there. And I knew one Muslim guy because I used to play pickup games with him in the gym at school. And I liked him because he wore like really baggy clothes and he had a big beard. And I just kind of liked his style, you know? And so I would, and I had, a, I think I had a class with him or something. So I'd just talk to him here and there. And he would always give me these really short, kind of like make you think kind of answers. And, uh, and that was just, it went on like that for a little while. And then I saw this flyer on campus that said American Muslim Week or something like that. And they had this series of events. So I picked up the flyer and I went to the event. And at this point still, I didn't know a whole lot of Muslims. And I went to the event and 
I met the the brothers there, and at first, honestly, I thought they were trying to hustle me because they were very much like, "What can we help you with? Can we do anything for you?" Can you know? They were very polite and and hospitable and stuff right. like that. And I'm like, "What is up with these guys? Like, what are they trying to get from me?" You know? And Malcolm X, the autobiography's <laughs> in my head too. You know? So I'm like, "What's your angle?" You know? <laughs> what's the pyramid scheme I'm going to be what's, sold what, there in a minute? What's your, what's your angle, brother? And he's yeah, like, yeah, "Well, there's no angle," you know. Angle. And uh, but then I realized that this is just how they are. Like, re really, we had an amazing, amazing group of people. Um, right. And so I got to know them a little bit, and then basically just one day we were, and then I started to like hang out with them in the library when we'd study and things like this, and not too long after that, and then they would go pray, you know, they'd be like, hey, we're going to go pray, do you want to come? And then one day I just said yes, and that was kind of like it, mm -hmm. it didn't, there was no like public shahada or anything like that. You know? <laughs> this is also, I think, where you meet your to-be wife. Your future yeah, yeah so yeah. after i became muslim because she's already on campus or yeah campus. she's on campus mm -hmm. after i became muslim what i always tell people is that campus culture works i think human culture works in the way that there's always a reference point mm. so every campus msa will have like their religious reference point one or two people who are kind of like the go-to and our msa that was my wife the who would become my wife so if i'm hanging out with the brothers and i'm asking them questions and they're not able to answer the questions they would tell me you have to go ask sister muslima and i would go ask sister muslima and it was like you know, we were like very rigid conservative people and so uh you know i would go ask her and it was like really awkward because like i'm talking to one of the sisters and like this kind of stuff yeah. and at the same time she used to kind of run like the muslim library out of the trunk of her car she had all these books that she would keep in the trunk of her car. And so I would borrow books from her, you know, like I borrow the book, I read it, I give it back. And she would kind of like give me these books. Were, 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 were cassette tapes a thing? Like, you know, uh, uh, we had CDs. Okay. Oh, sorry, but, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry for this. Not yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. We were past cassettes at this point. Okay. Like it was, it was, but barely past. Okay. You know, and, and you had to like work to get CDs, right? You Andrew, get, yeah. you get a couple okay. lectures. I, I remember I had, Probably like six lectures on three CDs, and those are, those are just on repeat all the time. Okay, yeah. And uh, See, a couple of them were from Imam Suhaib. A couple of them were from these like youth worker guys in Toronto or somewhere. You know, they were really good little lectures. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, and so, alhamdulillah. And then, so that's how I found out that this lady existed. Mm. And uh, no, I asked that because I mean, for me, again, just thinking by autobiographically in my own context. Um, the soundtrack of my life, and you know, in college was Imam Siraj Bahaj cassettes, mm -hmm. you know, and literally cassettes. So uh, I still had a car that was that had a cassette player. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, and obviously CDs were a thing, but Imam Siraj cassettes were ubiquitous in the nineties. Yeah, uh, they were at every conference. Yeah. And, I mean, alhamdulillah, his khutbas from you know Masjid Taqwa um, and Doctor so, Badawi's series. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember they used to come with that beautiful? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was like a set you would buy. Um, and then later on, Alhambra Productions, and I start hearing about Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and checking his stuff out. I'm, now I'm all, I'm attending ISNA as well, so that obviously informed where you know who I gravitated towards. But I mean, these cassettes were everywhere, and that was the way in a pre-internet age, knowledge was primarily disseminated, other than books, of course. And, right. and uh, you know what? Those you're get, the, I'm getting sentimental about those CDs yeah. and tapes because when you bought them, like. Man, it was you would different. you would want to finish like those fifteen the set of fifteen or twelve or what it what is yeah. like now it's like you 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 watch a reel and you swipe right and that's it the, the, right. the, the, you're not so really true. diving deep and into that topic your content was limited so like yeah I listened to the same lecture twenty times mm -hmm. so by the time you do that you really know that mm -hmm. you know you it do. becomes part of you it's not like just some so passing true. thing yeah. that doesn't settle yeah you got you it. Know? Now it's like you want to listen to, and even then, if you wanted to listen to someone, how do you find them? Like you have to go to a conference or you have to get the CD from somebody who went to a conference, exactly. basically, right? Right. So it was, you know, you really had to work for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was different. SubhanAllah, now it's like you're, you're begging people. You know, I always tell people, I'm like, listen, I feel like I'm almost done teaching what I want to teach publicly mm -hmm. in life at this point. You know, I just go on YouTube. There's hundreds of, probably hundreds of hours at this point of content on YouTube that I've done. Just go listen to it. 
you're like it's different it's it is it's so mm. different it's so different mm. yeah and and, and the, not yeah the content is different obviously the uh but also the way the consumer the consumer yeah. mindset like yeah. you mentioned you know, yeah uh, the consumer uh, experience but it's consumer. uh I, again i'm i'm probably coming across like an older guy no it's obviously I, not comparable right the level of connection no. just isn't there it's not no, like no, no, the, it's the, not. i think the I connection what, that what we it was was much better exactly. yeah absolutely i don't like, think we well, need to be shy in saying yeah. that or sound like we're old you yeah know, no old, yeah old, old joking, but yeah no, no, no but yeah, you're right 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. like i don't think like we really when we listened to a cd you write it we took it in we valued it we listened to it over and over again right. it was like on our shelf yeah but also the connection with the scholar yeah. was built just through through listening to them yeah. right like a literally a love for that speaker or scholar or teacher um i think and, now, and you'd hang on it you yeah know? it's like this is this weekend is the only time i'm gonna get to see so and so and right. he has two speeches yeah you know, so you're like, go to that lecture and you listen. You don't mess around. Or, so I have to, yeah. I have to just share a little anecdotal story. So I had come back from an international trip, um, and I, I was like, you know, my cousin Bervez. I, I don't know if you know where we're cousins. I stopped by. And I was like, okay, I'm going to visit him. But I was super jet lagged. This is 1999 <laughs> in Houston. It's a great memory. And um, yeah. I mean, I'm like literally like completely jet lagged yeah, totally. from an international yeah. trip. And um, he's like, okay, I left, definitely want to have you here. But I'm going to, I'm going to from Houston to Dallas. Yeah. So like a four hour drive. And I was like, sure. Just, and he wanted to see Dr. Sherman Jackson, who was spe- he came from Michigan to, love, to Dallas. So he Hood drove Hood. all the way. Yeah. yeah, and I was completely jack lagged, but we did it, and it was just like a very memorable uh, two in there yeah. in a day road trip, eight hours after all that jet lag. Um, so it was, you know, it was the memory. Yeah. And and you'll appreciate this, uh, Sheikh Jamal. The, the, that conference, I mean, I remember it vividly because. Um, I had never met Dr. Jackson up until that point, but I, I was familiar with him and I wanted to meet him. That was what yeah, it was. Yeah. And this was a Sana conference. So there was a Sharia Scholars of, uh-huh. uh, Association of North America. So the conference was pretty much like invitation only. Like it wasn't open to, I mean, they had, actually, I take that back. They did have public uh, sessions, but by and large, it was a meeting of scholars. And uh, in fact, I remember sitting in on a, a couple of the, of the, even the sessions that were public, they were all in Arabic. So mm-hmm. I, like I understood little to nothing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, but I, I just was basically like, I was camping kids camp out for to meet their favorite right, you know right, rock star or right. whatever it may be the case today i don't even know if that's a thing but whatever yeah. uh, we used to do that in the 90s but anyway yeah. um i i li- so I, I dragged omer this poor jet lagged omer <laughs> and there was another friend of ours uh, or a friend of mine yeah. and, and you know he would uh, and and he was with me as well and we like literally drove yeah four and a half hours and i got maybe a 15 minute face to face with yeah, dr yeah. jackson and that was that was the entire purpose of the trip like just to get those 15 minutes because like you said when you found out that a scholar or someone that you admired or listened to um came that was your only opportunity to engage them right uh or to get con- quote unquote content from them um and uh, yeah anyway so that's I, I will just throw out for yeah. just to shout out to you like as an old as an uh older brother's cousin right although you're like 18 months older than me <laughs> that's an impactful oh, thing to sure. see your old you know your cousin you look for up sure. to do that and then it influences you when you're going down that path you For know sure. a couple years later yeah. so just a little shout out thank you no, yeah. My, my, yeah you know i mean yeah anyway so i think the bigger story there is if i put dr sherman jackson on your radar you know <laughs> yeah. like you yeah. know I, i'm gonna put that as a w in my columns so. i remember the first time i met yeah. dr jackson too yeah. yeah. It was in McDonald's in Tahrir Square in downtown Cairo. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. You want to share it? or? I mean, that's pretty much the yeah. extent of it. We knew that he was this figure and we knew that he just is amazing. When was that? Words. Do you remember what year that was? That was probably maybe like 2008. Not 2006 or something. I think, you know, because he was doing summers. Uh, yeah. He would spend his he summer. He the summer thing there. So, we yeah. used to see him in the summer. Okay. And because yeah. you said that here square. So, at that time, AUC was there. Yes. Uh, AUC has since moved. But, um, uh, and, and he would teach the summer abroad there. Yeah. I mean, I, I attended the yeah. one in 2006. Okay. Uh, that was my first trip to Cairo. And you and I, I have talked about. I think it was Mike about, probably, yeah, maybe 2008. No, no, that, that program continued for a number of years. It was through Seton Hall Law yeah. School. And 
and he would teach the Islamic yeah, law I think uh, class. Pretty much every year we were there, he yeah. was there in the summer. Yeah, exactly. just, so that's actually a good good Sorry. transition to, to talk about Egypt. And like, yeah. so how do you now yeah. go from and, UCSD to and I making think, a massive, massive shift mm -hmm. and actually deciding you're going well, to go overseas? And I know this comes up later because I know, um, I wanted to ask, as you were becoming, you were finding your Muslim identity, um, and obviously that included praying now and, and, you know, like, again, public displays, if you will. The point is, uh, uh, like, your parents are probably noticing a change. Yeah. Is there any, and if you're comfortable talking about this, um, like, pushback or, hey, what's going on? I mean, yeah. or is it like, oh, that's cool. You and know, friends, I mean, too. And friends. Of, yeah. And, 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 oh, and yeah, yeah. Experience with right, friends right, as well. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. There's multiple layers to that. Um, so I used to go home regularly. Probably every two weekends I'd go home for the weekend. Um, so at some point I just went home and, and we were talking and, and I was like, yeah, so I'm a Muslim now. And my mom was just like, okay. You know, she, she didn't really, she's like, whatever, it's your life, do whatever you want. And my dad was like, my dad's response was, yeah, you've always been a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim, you know. <laughs> I was like, That's brilliant. Dad, I don't know about that. You know what I mean? Right, like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that was pretty much that. Yeah. Uh, their big concern was more what you would expect. Yeah, you know, it, how is this going to affect your school? How is it going to affect your career? Is this a phase? Are you going too extreme? And to be fair to them, like I probably was a, like a little bit overboard. Mm. I was a little bit extra. And um, were you kind of experiencing like that early convertitis or something? You know, yeah, I mean, for lack of a better word. Yeah, know. and the environment, the religious environment uh, that I it, I was in was also like that. In the sense that, like, what it meant to be religious was a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like so natural and so reasonable and stuff like that. It was a little bit. It was a little bit much. So definitely, that came home, and I was, you know. Eh not always like as polite as I should have been with my parents and stuff like yeah. that, but they were always supportive and they were always okay. fine. Alhamdulillah. I mean, they were not happy when, for example, like I decided I didn't want to go to medical school and all of these kind of, I, mean, I should say my dad wasn't so happy. My mom was always kind of, you know, you can study whatever you want to study, but my dad uh, wanted me to do certain things, which I understand. And he didn't want me to like go into religious studies per se, and I think that's because of how that was perceived and, and what he had seen from that probably in his childhood and stuff. Mm. So he probably felt like that's not going to be good for my son. I mean, he's not going to be able to take care of himself. He's not going to be able to take care of his family, stuff like that. They weren't so uh, into the, you know, they had some, I should say, they, they had some hesitations when I wanted to get married. Uh, again, which I think in retrospect were perfectly reasonable. Uh, because about a year, maybe a year into this whole thing, Again, like to give a glimpse into how extreme the mindset was. The mindset was like, I okay, I do Islam now. I, I do my prayers. I do these things. I'm a Muslim, everything else. I'm serious about Islam. All these other people um, that I'm around, you know, like serious MSA people and stuff like that, they're not Muslim enough. And so now I have to get involved in MSA West. MSA West was like this umbrella thing. It was like the next step up, you know. I get involved in MSA West. I feel like these people are not serious enough. So it's like, who's the most serious person I can find? Oh, it's this this woman, you know, Muslima. <laughs> and then marriage is half your dean. No one else is taking their dean so seriously. So maybe I should get married. Okay, I should get married to this lady. I should try to get married to this woman, you know. Yeah. So like that's how the whole thing happened, really. Wow. And uh, it's it, you know it's a little bit black and white. And so my parents were kind of like really shocked, you know, okay, like nine months ago, you were messing around with your whole life. It was a mess. And now you're like, you want to get married? It doesn't make any sense, you yeah. know? So, and what are you going to do? You don't have a job. Like we support you. <laughs> you <know>? Perfectly <laughs> reasonable. Perfectly like you said. reasonable. Who, yeah. What are you thinking? It doesn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. So subhanAllah, uh, it did actually work out in the end. The the Maimon blood came out strong, which was like eventually we did our we did we did our nikah. We did our nikah the day before the FAFSA application was due. FAFSA for those who may not know for federal yeah. like financial aid, yeah. government yeah. aid, right? Yeah. So financial aid from the government. So we we did our marriage. We did our marriage. We were able to apply FAFSA, uh, independent undergrad, married, and then mashallah, the government gave us a bunch of money. 
Yeah. Th things are a little bit different then in terms of California funding for universities and the cost of university and stuff like that was tremendously different. Mm -hmm. So the government gave us a bunch of money. We got married. We got our apartment. Like everything was fine. Wow. <laughs> you were like, you were like my role model in the nineties because yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, like you, I, I, I kind of caught the marriage bug in, in undergrad and I wanted to marry my, who today is still my wife, but uh, I wanted to get married. And my, uh, the, the conversations you had with your parents mirror exactly. Yeah. The conversations that they I were perfectly had. Except, reasonable. Except uh, they didn't give me the green light to get go ahead. And get they didn't give me the green light either. <laughs> I had to wait till uh, I graduated. I, I kind of just did it anyways. Got it. Got and it. well, there was pushback from the in laws too. I'm glad they came along. With <laughs> exactly. My in laws, my in laws were so, mashallah. You know, okay, I think because you know they had I don't know I I can't recall what you guys ended up getting into with the interview with my wife, but you know they had the experience of losing everything. Yeah. We did a little so, bit. So they weren't like so worried about that. Mm -hmm. They were kind of like, if you're going to get, if you're getting married for the right reason and you're doing it in the right way, Allah's going to provide. And mm -hmm. subhanAllah, it, it worked out. Mm -hmm. So that, I guess, leads us to Egypt in a sense also. Well, or is there another piece there? Th there is a little other piece that you, as you were talking, you got me thinking. And that flavor that you mentioned, um, and I don't want to get any of us in hot water, so we don't, but that flavor of Islam that you found prominent uh, in your MSA or, or whatever may be the case, uh, West Zone, et cetera. In, now in retrospect, or in hindsight, I should say, sorry, hindsight, um, how, how much of that you think is, regardless of what it, how we, like, we have, I think there's a part of us that we can make commentary as, as now people who have who graduated and were quote unquote more mature and, and so on. But how much of that I think you think is, is also sort of just coming of age and almost necessary. This kind of goes back to Omar's point. Yeah. You know, like getting that kind of bit by that extremism bug mm -hmm. to an, a certain extent, whatever that flavor may be. I mean, you know, whether it's, you know, Salafis or whether it's H HT on campus. I mean, these are the mm -hmm. two groups that pr pr like that predominated, area, yeah. I think, at the MSA scene uh, going into the 2000s, certainly when I was, you know, in college in, in the 90s. So, I, I, because shortly after coming out of those movements, I remember looking back in disdain and what a waste of time and so on. But now as it's more mm. in the rear view, I've come to appreciate what that did for me. Mm. Yeah. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. And, and and I had, I right. actually had, and I didn't go through that per se, right. uh, um, but I had the exact same thought of when, when you were talking about that. Cause I'm like, well, you ended up, mashallah, in a good place, I'm right? Done. From a Dean perspective. No Cause we, you and I, Pervez, have talked about this. It's right. like with the, the next generation, a, lo uh, a lot of parents, what they're doing is they're, they, they're not using that old style of like black and white, you got to do this the way yeah. our parents did with us. We in, we just naturally knew there were certain things we had to do, there were certain things we couldn't do. Right. But I don't remember any conversations with our parents no. that, about like, here's why exactly. and explaining it to us and debating us and trying to convince it was, us. It was just the way it was. Exactly. Yeah. And with this generation, we're trying to like reason with them and saying, okay, here's why we want you to do this, but it's up to you. And once you feel good about it, you can do it. And that mm -hmm. hasn't, honestly, I don't think that's yeah. worked. No, yeah. And, and I've only realized that, you know, mm -hmm. now yeah. later down the road. And I also realized that I'm not the only one no. who had mm -hmm. taken that approach because we were essentially reacting to how our parents did it. Did it. But in retrospect, I think that was no, say what you the, will. the right approach, right? So anyway, just kind of thinking yeah, about I think that. all the commentaries on Gen Z and millennials, well, specifically Gen Z, I mean, they are a product of the fact that they had Gen Xers as parents. Mm -hmm. So it, it, what, you're experience, what you're sharing is mm -hmm. not unique to you. I yeah. mean, I think it's a, gener a yeah. generational problem. And when we talk about we, like... Yeah, we have ahead. this sort of negotiating sort of method method with our children, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the way we were taught by the boomers, mm -hmm. which was like rote memorization, yeah. black and white, you do this, period. Yeah. Mm. So but we've seen with just even in with, even within my family, I've seen um no, there's uh, like I mean, people like my my nephews and whatnot, Dave, who were primarily taught by their grandmother a exactly. lot of stuff. Very black and white approach. But but they actually it actually worked it even pays with, off. so it's like we almost did like an A B test. Um uh, and, and saw that that old yeah, methodology works. That too. I've been Pardon me? About that. I've been thinking about that yeah. too. This topic is very interesting. Yeah. Can I ask I, I how, don't have, how old are your kids? I don't have any conclusions on it, but I think it's interesting. My kids are about to be 11 and 6. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
peak I, peak uh, peak there's like your peak influence you have on yeah, them right yeah now. this yeah. is I'm, I'm every day i look at my son and i'm like i, I already miss you you know may allah keep them close to us and i mean, I mean yeah. and uh, you know preserve the relationships and stuff but i know he's at that age and yeah but alhamdulillah they're great kids and i try i try to explain to them as little as i possibly can actually <laughs> as crazy as that sounds no no that yeah. because there's I, wisdom there I, I tell them like you know there's times we can sit down and we can study and we can talk and stuff like this but you need to understand that i'm in charge of this mm-hmm. and you're you're my child and i think that you you know i think we have enough track record now that you understand that i'm not like some crazy person mm-hmm. and you know I, if i tell you something i'm telling you for a reason if you want to understand it you know that's different conversation but when i tell you it you need to do it and uh, yeah we're working on it alhamdulillah right <laughs> parenting I, is fun I, yeah. I think i'm gonna memorize that that those yeah. lines yeah. uh so uh, it's it's fun it doesn't i mean uh, again i i'm very cognizant of the age that i'm at right now i can get away with that right now i might not be able to get away with that in a year or two right yeah. so but you've created the foundation see i think that's yeah. that that's the key inshallah inshallah like i mean you know um because you you've you've, you've kind of laid down that foundation that i think we growing up because i know how umar grew up and how i grew up and our families were so similar in many ways um you know that kind of that that methodology of it and i think maybe negotiating is not, not even the right word it was you know that we that meaning the the way we the parenting style we adopted as in as parents mm-hmm. i it was but there was a less importance placed on things that our parents stressed when we were younger yeah. which was like rote memorization yeah. which was like you know you just do this like there's mm-hmm. no understanding the why and the benefits and you know and whereas i think at least, at least the way i was with my daughters it was the other way around yeah. where i didn't stress yeah. the rote memorization but it was more like okay i want them to appreciate why they're doing this yeah. and at the end yeah. of the day now i've come to regret that yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, 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 it is yeah. it's i think total, in the same boat because when you get them in their the head thing. of like Okay, I see the benefits, but also I yeah. see the, the like now right. it gets into their logical. But brain. now it's like, wait, did I want them using their logic? Because exactly. their logic's not developed. It's not yeah, developed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. 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 But I think I think there's some in between. Yeah, uh, but there I, is, I, there's I, some I of it think, that was a little bit too much. And I ask you, I asked you specifically that question because I also I know just I imagine in the work that you do in the community even now you come into contact with college, you know kids in college. And in yeah. fact, well, I, I teach imagine. in Islamic school. So yeah. I teach See. currently eighth through twelfth. You I've were just taught before me. that six through twelve. I taught before that four through eight. So yeah. yeah. So you're in the trenches. See, I, I'm I'm a little bit more detached, um, as it were, from the trenches. Other than raising my own kids, and that's a that, that, that that's, that's the enough. trenches. That, that is the trenches. But yeah. um, so I I, did, I asked that because like like in terms of what you're seeing in the you know in the community even now, you almost feel oh, like man. that. That experience of the college MSA, and I don't even know what the what that flavor looks like now. I mean, I, maybe it's changed since when we went to college. It's it's different, but the the scene is there's certain things, unfortunately, I think that are uh-huh. beginning to resurface now. Okay, in what sense? Uh, like some of this really black and white, yeah. a little bit too much, um, dismissive, kind of obnoxious <laughs> understanding of Islam is resurfacing. Mm. Yeah. And because, frankly, because it's it's really easy to do internet marketing with it. Yeah, it's 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 That's easy. Right. It's easy to do it in short clips. It's easy to. That's it's so it's true. very viral, and it's and it's uh and it's uh, by design. Mob- yeah, oh, and wow. it's mobility. No, it's no, viral. Yeah, you you touched point. on something that we've a, talked about. No, these, no, some of these ideas are vi- like, for example. Yeah, um, you nailed it. Uh, if the hadith is cor- if the hadith is authentic, then it's my medhab. Yeah. Like there's certain statements they they essentially went viral before there was an idea of virality. And virality. But there was something about them that caught on with people. Yeah. If the hadith is sound, then it's my medhab. Okay, but then when you really look at it, and then they'll say, "Well, all of the imams said this." No, actually, all the imams didn't say that. They said things that were kind of similar to that. That's right. And you didn't clearly read the thousands of imams that followed those imams and what they understood from the imam's statement that makes it clear that what you're promoting as that understanding is not actually what people understood it to be, the scholars. And a million issues are the same. And I'm dealing with my son all the time on these things. He's like, I keep coming to prayer and the kid keeps putting his foot on my foot. And I'm like, tell him. (laughs) 
none of the four imams said you should do this. And he's like, but he said the hadith is there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, subhanAllah. And then in the MSA, same thing. Certain things, like, they become, they pick up again. You know, same conversations. I'm like, subhanAllah, wow. we literally had this conversation 20 years 20 ago. Years we ago. put it to rest. And everyone was comfortable and happy, alhamdulillah. And now they're coming back. But subhanAllah, there's some wisdom in that too, I think. Yeah. It's necessary. These different ideas, these different approaches, these di it's necessary because it keeps scholarship on edge. It keeps yeah. research on edge. It keeps people people uh, there. I mean, what am I seeing with young people? Uh, I mean, this is probably, we're jumping the gun now. I have a number of major concerns, but I don't know if you want to do that yeah, now let's, or if you want to do it let's later. Let's go, let's, let's yeah. I, I think it's okay well, to, I mean, we, 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 we're going to talk to you about your Egypt experience okay, for sure, yeah. but since we are since on the topic are on of the college, topic, yeah. college life, because I'm of two it. minds. I mean, before you like make your point, like, like, I am of two minds because on the one hand, like I said, now in hindsight, you know, 2020, I look back at those years and I say, you know, alhamdulillah for those years. And I, I'm, I'm not so, you know, reactionary in terms of being regret, like remorseful of wasting all those years in, in, in whatever methodology, whatever you want to call it. But that exact mindset that you, that you referenced. Um, and I, so I think there's, there's two things happening. One, I think that that methodology, one back in our time, certainly before virality, before social media lends itself to being, um, you know, the, the, the young mind has an attraction for it because it's black and white, it's simple, it's not complex, it's, it's cookie cutter, you know, you take mm -hmm. it and run with it. But I, I did, what, what I didn't, I never fully appreciated until you raised it is that how brilliantly it also fits into today's, the one we, like, we were just talking about the way kids consume Content, content. Yeah. huge it's all the perfect. time they're it's, asking me these things i saw this on designed TikTok. for this on the TikTok. two minute clip it's derived it's it's designed to go viral because of its simplicity mm -hmm. um so please and because I mean, of its nefsani nature simplicity and it's nefsani it's like very base desires so it's perfect for for virality yeah, you know, subhanAllah, Allah help us. <laughs> I, you know, I think that... No, but you said you had some concerns. Yeah, yeah my not, main yeah. concerns mm -hmm. are essentially the the <clears throat> lack of discipline and attention span that comes from technology mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. And then the other issue is, and I think this is the core issue really, is that any incorrect understanding, any understanding that isn't real and lasting <sighs> how do you deal with that what do you mean by real and lasting if i mean just so for example yeah. you might have these maybe you have this moment of passion it lasts for a year or two but after that it's gone there's no there's no real staying power to the person's commitment to the religion like there's something there mm -hmm. um it, it doesn't build relationships it doesn't keep families together it doesn't keep communities together it doesn't so there's no longevity to that certain understandings of, of islam and community life and so how do you deal with that and this is my main concern actually is that you have to have suhba you have to have true real good companionship mm -hmm. ideally multi-layered not just with people that are in your own generation. Thank you need you. people that are older than you. And especially you need that with righteous, good people yeah. and people of knowledge. And what I'm seeing on in general in a community level is a complete collapse of that. Hmm. Uh, you don't see religious teachers who actually spend time with people in their communities. And that is a big problem. That is a big problem. Hmm. Um I mean, I don't want to say that. I don't want it to sound like I'm not appreciating the work that is being done. There is. Mm, right. But I think we have this phenomenon of like younger imams, scholars, things like this, who weren't able to hold down full-time positions in Masajid for any number of reasons. Full-time. I use the Masjid because that's really the most regular touch point for community life. Mm -hmm. Not because I feel that that's the only place that people should be employed, but because that's where you see people. Mm -hmm. And what we need in our religious development is actually to see people over and over again. That's right. We need to see them day in and day out, week in and week out. I need to have relationships that are like, I've known this uncle for 20 years, 10 years. They gave me advice. I knew I could go talk to them. We need like the actual fabric of social life is, and, and the people who make that, 
real and valuable in terms of what Islam is supposed to look like for someone who understands the religion, is able to be committed to it, is able to maintain their relationships, is able to function in everyday life, is able to contribute to the society that they live in, so on and so forth. We need those examples to be in the lives of younger people. Sure. And what I'm seeing is that we don't have that. Um, why like why is that happening outside of leadership meaning like you you identified uh, like issues with leadership but why is that not happening on the communal or even family level like are multi-generational families not a thing anymore is that like that's no longer as in vogue as much as it used to be for us like i mean i know I, I you think, you yeah. had your like your grandmother was with you in your home yeah you know, I, I mm. spent a considerable amount of time with my grandparents. Um, and so th is that so lacking? I'll tell you something yeah. anecdotally. Sure. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, when elders came over just to meet my parents, mm -hmm. I would go sit with them. Oh, yeah, I had nothing to. better to do. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, my parents- and you were even expected if I, to do yeah, that. Was, exactly, you yeah. got it. That's what I was going to say. I not forget even have, whether I had something better to do or not. I was expected to. Now, I, what I've seen is- the kids go off and mm -hmm. they're playing PlayStation or whatever, and the adults are catching up on their their stuff, and so that connection is lost. So, like you can be, you can you can have this family, this this um, your neighbor or whatever you or your commute person from your community. They come over regularly, mm -hmm. but your kids still don't know them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see now way. how the second point is tied into the first. It is. because if you don't have the necessary self discipline and focus. To be able to sit and listen to someone who's older than you, mm -hmm. you can't sit and listen to them. Yeah. Because your brain is fried from some piece, device, you know? Mm -hmm. Like Absolutely. I've I've had kids when we in school sometimes every now and then we would do like a screen time check in, you know? Yeah. And one of the kids I was really proud of him, subhanAllah. We 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 did a check in and he had an outrageous amount of hours of TikTok in his week, you know. I, I can't remember what the number was. It was like in the thirty or forty hours of TikTok in the week, you wow. know. <laughs> it was something crazy. Right. And yeah. and I was shocked. And you know, and then I, the next year came and I was talking to him. I'm like, so what's going on with you? What's going on? and I was just kind of joking with him a little bit. He's like, you know, after that day I realized that this is a problem. And I decided that all of that time I was spending on this, I'm gonna spend on Quran. So inshallah mm -hmm. this year I'm gonna finish my hives. And I was like, where did this come from? SubhanAllah. Like, yeah. <laughs> this kid like completely flipped and he was going to finish his whole hips wow. in, in the course of one year. Yeah. Because like instead of TikTok, he was doing it in his memorization. Yeah. Uh, but my the point more broadly is that you have to be able to sit and listen. Exactly. You have to be able to like do that. And I think that like that barrier to connection is real. Yeah. And so how do we get across that barrier? I think is is a big question. And just just a side note, what I always tell my my daughter, my sixteen year old, I'm like, you can be on social media, but remember, it's just commercials. It's essentially yeah. a marketing tool yeah. where they're trying to sell you something. Like, just yeah. be mindful that yeah. everything you see is somebody so trying to get some money from you're you. You're the product, right? Now. You're yeah. the product. Yeah. 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 So um, it's it's, <clears throat> but I think on a community level, it's really really and and you know I don't I don't know how. Like if we don't have religious teachers and we, for example, like I know many imams, they haven't been able to stay in their positions because of what's expected from them. Mm. And it's not reasonable. And if you do the things that are actually the real stuff that needs to get done, the administration gets upset with you because they're like, you missed Salat or you did this, or you did that. I understand Salat is important, but if I'm having lunch with like some kid or even some family. If I went to dinner with some family and, and they had some friends over and we sat together, 15 of us, and we had this nice conversation and I connected with them and they connected with me. And like, that's a lot more valuable probably than me leading Maghrib prayer. I hate to say, you know, like, no, no. I hope people don't misunderstand that. I don't but, think they should. You know, like I can teach someone how to read the Quran and they can lead Maghrib prayer. But can I teach them to be able to connect with other people and, and bring the hearts together and and like what that does for community life is extremely important. So true. And so now you have like a lot of the people who I think could could do that kind of work are are not in positions to do it. And if you get into this kind of like one of the, one of the brothers we know he wrote it as the Imam gig economy. There's like the <laughs> Imam he does one gig he does another gig gig, gig he do, but there's no downtime. Mm. It's like there's no flex space mm. in in the property, right? There's no flex space in the property. Yeah, I can have an office, 
but there's a bunch of other things I can't do that I would have been able to do if I had that flex space. Yeah. So I think that we have this issue of like, and it actually now I believe with the way things are, it requires more time than it used to. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. Oh, yeah. Like be, before it used to, maybe you could have got there with a couple hours sitting with someone. Now you're going to have to do more than that actually to get through to them. And once I, you get through to them, it would be great, but we have to be able to do it. You know, um, oh, I mean, we, we like we mentioned this at the outset, I, you know, I was overseas uh, during the winter break and, um, <clears throat> One of the things that we sort of talked about as a family was how isolated and lonely, if you will, mm -hmm. our existence and our life is in the United States. Absolutely. You go abroad and, you know, like we were just sitting there, like, I'm just, you know, like you, you can't get any more sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, than this. I mean, we were just sitting in like Fishawi, like in, mm -hmm. in the Khan Khalili, and we're just mm -hmm. surrounded by people. But that's the reality everywhere mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. Whether, and Makkah Medina is the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just surrounded by people who, and you're forced to interact, whether it's mm -hmm. like telling the guy, trying to sell you something you're not interested, mm -hmm. or it's just, you know, um, the table next to you, they're just, uh, you know, like they're, like there's the idea of personal space isn't there. It's like much more fluid. It's way more fluid. And so I think, um, in American life, how much what you're talking about is needed because of the lack of that in the real world. And, and I think there's a reason for yeah. it. The, um, part, it doesn't explain it all, but it explains some of it, which is the the hecticness of American yes. life. Yeah. I'll tell you something, and just personal. 100%, absolutely. Person, so my brother and I were talking yesterday, uh, last night, and I was sharing him how I've been working in tech for 26 years straight. Yeah, like literally from college graduation up until now, but I did have my very first break last summer where I got laid off for the very first time. Mm. Um, and for the very first time I had a break to act and, and, and he was saying, and we were talking about how that break is a time you actually, for the first time, get out of the rat race, the, the groundhog day uh, thinking, mm -hmm. and you actually have a time to reflect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of, you know, like some of the biggest blessings came out of that time I had, 100%. I got married and like I ha had a chance to reflect and make some big decisions and act on them. Um, but when you're in the rat race, yeah. you don't have that. So you don't have time yeah. to reflect about deeper things. You don't have time to yeah. uh, focus on those connections. That, we we that, went on that road trip to Chicago. I mean, that, you know, for, I mean, I know yeah. we're, we're, we're uh, like yeah. giving a little peek behind the curtain to our listeners. I mean, one, you got remarried. So again, we, we can save that for later. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> from all of our listeners. Um, but also, um, you know, like I remember that week and, 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 and you, like we were in the, we were just hanging out in the community in Chicago yeah. mm -hmm. and, 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 and we spent so much time at different places and institutions and people. And I, mean, I remember that being really like impactful for you. For sure. Right, sure. right, because yeah. you had that sort of downtime. I yeah. mean, you know, that was a time you were, yeah, hundred percent. You were sort of in between, and that's, that's and that's what we don't. Ha that's what we. I think, yeah. broadly speaking, yeah. it's that people are missing that. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. And that and to just to go back to your point about yeah. what you saw overseas, they oh, have yeah. something, but it's related to just mm -hmm. the the rat race. Oh, it yeah. very much is. But we have to learn also how to get along with each other in a sense. Mm. You know, like life in Cairo is crazy. If you live in Cairo, and the inflation and stuff right now is insane. Oh, People insane. are working unbelievable amounts of work. So, like, their life is very hectic, too. Mm. But somehow they have a culture that allows them to get along with each other. Exactly. And, uh, or at least that they know how to do that. You know, I was, I keep telling the story that happened to me recently when we were in, we, I went back to Egypt for the first time after almost 12 years. And we were on this flight. Is an internal flight in Egypt, so, so that meant that pretty much everyone on the flight is Egyptian, you know. And we get on the runway, or, or on the yeah, I guess it's the runway, and the plane just doesn't take off. And we're sitting there forever, and people are getting like antsy a little bit, but they all know how to talk to each other. Yeah, it's not like here's this person in their little pod. Don't even look at me. You know, it's very fluid. Like you could talk to the person next to you. It's no problem in front of you, whatever, so on and so forth. And then like the pilot starts making this announcement and his announcement, he's like stumbling through his announcement. And 
eventually someone in the plane just yells out to him. He's like, Salli al Nabi Hatigi, which means like, make salat on the Prophet, it'll come to you. And everyone just burst <laughs> laughing, you know. And then this person's talking to this person, and you have multiple characters. Yeah. But everyone knows the characters. Like, you have one guy, he's clearly starting to lose it. He's getting really angry. He's making all kinds of comments, you know, this and that. But everyone knows him. They're like, okay, so we know that character. He's, yeah. That's my uncle. <laughs> Ahmed, you know? Yeah. I know how to deal with him. I know how to talk to him. So someone will go to him and be like, Manish, Manish, it's going to be okay. Salih yeah. Nabi. So I know that, like there's a whole way of interacting with each other that people kind of like, we can do this. Exactly. You know? no, my and, kids literally would ask me, like, I, I, same thing. We were actually taking a, a, a local flight from Cairo to Luxor and, we were, and, and, and they were taking forever to board. Mm -hmm. And we're just at the gate and we're waiting in line. And, and again, there's no personal space. I mean, people are, are like just jam packed like sardines and we're just waiting in this like hallway. And, but the way people are interacting with one another, my, like my daughter looks to me and she says, you know, like, are we on this point? Like, do you like, you know, are there like 50 people that know each other? I'm like, no, they don't know They've each other. They've other. never met each yeah. other. I go, what you're seeing is just normal life in Egypt. Yeah. Or, or outside yeah. of America, I yeah. should say. I don't know about other places. Yeah, exactly. In you're Egypt, right. for no, sure. For sure. Yeah. People know how to talk to each right. other. They have like. Because, like, yeah, you're right. And I, 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 I hesitate also to make that claim because, I mean, Umrah is so different because, you know, you're just surrounded by it's It's, it's a much more of a multicultural yeah. sort of experience. Difference in culture might be part of it. Totally. Yeah. But, yeah, the Egypt thing, yeah, is, you nailed it. And and uh, that was such a. Uh, that might, like, like my, my, my children had never experienced that. Yeah. yeah, it's an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. Like to feel like I could actually just go up to a random person, spend half an hour with them, we'd get along, we know how to, we'd have a good time, we'd tell some jokes, we'd leave, and like we'd be friends. You don't do that with your neighbors incredible. in America. You know, your incredible. actual neighbors. Everything is awkward and anxious, and, is, and right. like, you don't know what to say and what not to say, and you don't know what's going to upset somebody, and then someone's angry, and all of a sudden you're not allowed to talk anymore. Like it's it's just really yeah, the whole thing is really clunky. Yeah, <laughs> but in the way the way that they move is very uh, no. You know, I think that says a lot. Of, a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, and so tell us, let's, let's, let's not actually talk sure. about your yeah. Egypt experience. Yeah. Uh, you you go, you decide with your wife to go study there. Yeah, uh, yeah it was actually part of her conditions of our marriage. So, mm. uh, was that we go study. And all really? we really knew at that time was Egypt. We she literally had, put it in the contract or something. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> like, basically, she has the right to divorce if I, if I uh, don't fulfill this issue, you know? Right. So, alhamdulillah, we, we went to Egypt and... Uh, I mean this this part these parts we we barely got anywhere yet in this whole thing but uh yeah I mean Egypt is a big story um and I think a lot of the people that were with me in Egypt they'd be surprised of my perspective on Egypt now because I was very cynical I was very negative I was very arrogant very dismissive of a lot of things in Egypt when I was in Egypt and it took some time afterwards to kind of like understand things better and to get different perspective and more experience and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, you know, we went to Egypt, we, we studied Arabic. The way that Azhar works is that, or it, I shouldn't say works because it's always changing, but the way it worked then was that you study Arabic first and then you test into the high school. Uh, the best you could do is test into the high school. So we tested into the high school, alhamdulillah, last year of the high school. We finished the high school. Um, in our cohort, we had a very nice cohort. You know, like two years ahead of us was Imam Suhaib Webb. Uh, a year ahead of us was Sheikh Amr Saeed from Mad Mamluk's podcast. Uh, Sheikh Suhail Mullah, who now runs the Khalil Center LA branch. Um, a couple other people. And then in our actual year was myself and my wife, uh, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi in the East Coast, Sheikh Osama Sanhiya, who's also in the same community as him, uh, Sheikh Arsalan Haq in Dallas, and Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans in Chicago, and Sheikh Hamza Abdul Malik in Tennessee. But we were like, Amazing. mashallah, wonderful cohort. Um, and most of us spent a lot of time together and... Um, you know, it was great, alhamdulillah. So we did the high school and then went to the college, alhamdulillah, finished the college. Uh, we had to leave a little bit early because the revolution happened, 2011, January 2011. But we finished, alhamdulillah, and then, uh, you know. That's and, and what was, if you're willing to share, what was the thing that you had the 180 on that and say, wow, that was actually a good thing or have a different perspective on? 
Whatever you're comfortable sharing, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that <clears throat> I think that I was really young, and I was, and I, for whatever reason, didn't have the kind of guidance that would make things work. Uh, I feel like if I if if I had good guidance. I could have made things work and I could have understood them appropriately and and had a good experience. But somehow that didn't happen that way, probably because of my own inadequacies. But um, like, for example, I was, I mean, the reality of Egypt and the reality of the Azhar system, uh, whenever I speak about an Azhar, there's, uh, we have to kind of like take a step back and yeah. understand that an Azhar is an institution of a thousand years. And it's an institution that goes far beyond the walls of a university in the modern sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a modern university now, but it wasn't traditionally a modern university. And there were knowledges and disciplines of knowledge that were learned in Al-Azhar that maybe don't... For some people, don't get learned as much today. For some people, they do. There are still really, really amazing scholars in, in, in Al-Azhar. And I don't think that I had a good appreciation of that. I think that I came out of a Western academic experience, which was very arrogant driven, arrogance driven, very much like, I know how to do this. Why do I need to follow what someone else did? Why do I need to study the books that children study? I can, I can have bigger conversations. I can do, and I, I just think I had an overall bad understanding of what it means to study Islam and why the traditional model is effective mm. and, and why it's important. Um, and then, that combining with the reality of just a system that doesn't really work so well, um, you know, sometimes your professors are good, sometimes they're not. Sometimes uh, you find a good class outside and it goes for like four sessions and the sheikh just stops coming and like that happens 20 times, you know, it starts to get to you after a while. Uh, I think that there's a way to do Egypt that is really beneficial. Hmm. Well, and if people do that, they'll really benefit from Egypt. But if you just kind of like go in blind, and we were one of the first generations going into Azhar that we knew about and stuff like that, you know, so it was, there was a learning curve to that. But, but, I'm, but I'm did, grateful for it. But you did finish, right? You were there seven years. Yeah. I'm grateful for it. And I, and I think that so, despite everything I'm saying, the curriculum is still strong and there's still a lot to benefit but I, there was definitely a lot of things that I had to, I'm continuing to like, you know, make up on. And <laughs> outwardly, it didn't work out, but uh, some ways it worked out really okay. well, you know. So like to, to the point you were making, I mean, how, how much do you think was, because I almost find it fascinating because on the one hand, I would think as someone, you know, as a Westerner going to the Muslim world, th there's a certain romanticized version that we have or like a romanticization that we go with or expectations. Uh, do you think that was part of your initial sort of like uh, part of that initial feeling that you had was disillusionment essentially of the of this romanticized construct that you had created of studying Islam overseas? Perhaps it's possible. Okay. I, I don't really recall 100 percent, but it's definitely possible. Um I mean, I don't know. I mean, do people still do that? I mean, like, I maybe, maybe I'm. It's you know, I, I'm know. speaking anecdotally to yeah. uh, how my experiences were. I mean, not having studied at Al Azhar or anything, but yeah. uh, formalized in that way. But um, just going with that sort of mindset or that uh, idea or romanticized idea that yeah. you had of the of, of probably we were hoping for certain things that we didn't find mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. Uh, and I think actually, in, in some, in many ways, the situation now is better than it was then. There's, uh, especially for like women, there's more opportunities, yeah. there's, there's more openness. Um, certain things have changed in that time. But, you know, I, even if I was to have found it, I'm not sure that I would have accepted it. Mm. Because of where I was intellectually and also because of where I was spiritually. Mm. That I just, I, you know, I just, I didn't, uh, you know, it was a necessary thing that I went through. Alhamdulillah, it's qadr is qadr. It's okay, you know, so it's, we can always look back and say different things, but I mean, in the grand experience of my life, so like, for example, when we were in Egypt, every year we literally prayed to Stikhara to leave Egypt. Uh, like, wow. we're done with this oh, place, yeah. we need to leave this place, I can't stand this place anymore. But every year when we would pray to Stikhara, our decision would be we need to stay in Egypt. And I, I couldn't really understand that, you know, at the time. But in retrospect, 
like studying in Al-Azhar and being able to say at least at some level that I'm Azhari is, you know, after Islam, after my wife, after my shuyukh, like probably I think the greatest blessing in my life. Like to be able to say at this point, I'm like, I'm, I'm really believe in this institution. I really believe in this methodology. I really believe in, in the people who, who carry it forward. They're not always the ones that everyone knows about, but there is a tradition of an Azhar that is really strong. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this institution is absolutely essential to the, to Islam in the world and has been for hundreds of years. And so to be able to, like have anything to do with that to me is like the greatest shut off. It's the greatest honor. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And honestly, I, I spend most days waking up thinking to myself, you are supposed to be an Azhari. There are certain things that you need to get right. You need to study this. You need to review this. You need to memorize this. You need to, and, and every, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at least, I'm, I'm 40 years old and I'm about 45 years behind. So, so it's an impossible task, but, you know, I'm hoping that maybe some of it will be like Imam al-Shafi said, you know, that I, or what Imam Ahmed said to Imam al-Shafi, that when Imam al-Shafi said, uh, He said, I love the righteous people even though I'm not from them. And, uh, and I said, and I hope that I will get their intercession. And I, I hate those people who do sins, even though we have the same business. And then Imam Ahmed said, He said, you love the righteous people and you're from them. That the person who's the, love, the lover of a people or the friend of a people, then he's included from among them. Yeah. So I just, you know, I... I Every all the time, I feel inadequate as as an azhari, but at the same time, you know, it's an honor to be an azhari, and I, I just, uh, you know, that's that's a uh, that's an ocean of a topic. Mm, yeah, you know? And, so, you know, something that I I appreciated this last visit of mine was um, how much locally, like if you talk to the local people, and again, again, this is just pure mm -hmm. anecdotal, but people that I spoke with about their impressions of the institution is how how high uh, or how high, highly it still is held in oh, regard yeah. the love and respect the love and respect for azhar al-sharif is you know it's palpable azhar al-sharif exactly. yeah, you can't even in english no. you say an azhar but in in arabic you'll never just say an azhar never you always say, it's like the i mean walillahi uh, al al-a'la i hope someone doesn't misunderstand what i'm saying yeah, but like yeah. in most of our languages we don't say the quran mm -hmm. only in english we say the quran so true in every other language it has to have a description that's right and quran and majeed and quran yeah. and kareem and quran is sharif quran sharif yeah you never say it without that you know so and, and azhar is like that you yeah. never say an azhar without an azhar sharif exactly um and it and it really is and that's yeah. because the people understand that even if, and this is the nature of great institutions and it's why institutions are so important because institutions are about producing a representatives of a concept in a sense. It's not about particular individuals. Yeah. So yeah, you have the institution of Azhar, you're going to have fake sheikhs, you're going to have government sellouts, you're yeah. going to have all kinds of these things. But the people also know that you're going to have great scholars, you're going to have great righteous people, the people are also going to know you're going to have the sheikh that sits in the neighborhood and teaches my kids the Qur'an, right. brings them candy and like all these other things. Like yeah. they're going to, uh, they know that there's more to it than the five people that someone's upset about. And, and American Muslims are really off on this point. They really are. See, and I, and I, I, I don't know if it's a, com I think some of it is hasad. I think some of it is just, uh, you know, trying to spread lies in order to promote their own institutions or whatever else it might be. Some of it is just ignorance. But there's a really, you know, people are like, well, what about this? I'm like, do you understand? There's literally thousands of scholars in Al-Azhar. We're not talking about this one person that you know. Yeah. Like, what about the sheikh? We used to go to the sheikh. He used to teach us Al-Fiyat ibn Malik, uh, the thousand-line poem in uh, in Arabic grammar with the commentary of Ibn Aqil, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was blind. We used to go to, a, it, was a, it was a school and a masjid in the middle of a graveyard. The sheikh would come walking out of nowhere 
Like, who knows where he came from? He's fully blind. He's walking into the thing. Someone leads him in. He sits down. He, tell, he tells everyone, just go ahead and, and write down what I'm going to recite. And he gives us the entire poem, commentary on the poem, everything from his memory. Do you know him when you're complaining about the institution is like this and like this and like exactly. this? You don't know the hundreds yeah. and thousands of people that yeah. are true inheritors of this tradition that are just being neglected because you have a political issue with two people. That's right. And I think, uh, you know, you, I think you nailed it. The American mindset when it comes to these type of institutions or countries or uh, cultures, because I think like the, the difference when I went to Egypt for the first time, it was 2006. Uh, and then versus going just this past winter. The difference mm -hmm. I found, and again, this is all hindsight, of course, is the attitude that I went with in 2006 was very much informed by what was in, what was the zeitgeist in the Muslim community post 9-11, mm -hmm. which was extremely dismissive, derivative, uh, uh, derisive of the... Um, uh, of, of, of the Muslim world, mm -hmm. the backwardness, mm -hmm. the extreme, you know, mm -hmm. and so the pendulum, you know, and, and pre 9-11 wasn't like that. There was almost the opposite, which mm -hmm. was this. And so now I'm seeing sort of the pendulum shift again where, and inshallah, this time, hopefully it's more balanced and nuanced and sustaining as opposed to the kind of pendulum mm -hmm. that we've experienced just in the 30 years of my, you know, of ex that I experienced. But that, um, that 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 was very much what the attitude that I went with in 2006 versus now. And, mm -hmm. and, and why I appreciated it. Yes, yeah, And picked up on things. Amazing. Like I just said, I don't know if, I don't think 2000, in 2006, Azhar al-Sharif was as revered, or was less revered. It's just that I wasn't picking up on it because I mm -hmm. went with this mindset. Mm -hmm. This is a moribund institution. It's outdated. Mm -hmm. it, you know, they're, mm -hmm. you know, it's great uh, about, you know, teaching the text, but there's no context. There's no mm -hmm. historical, academic, you know, mm -hmm. right. I mean, these, these were all the things that were informing my perception of, of not only Azhar, but also just yeah. that culture as, yeah, as, yeah. A, as a and whole. And I think I was the same. Yeah. So I and wasn't I wanna, able to appreciate it. Yeah, I just really quickly want to say that, you know, you talked about the importance of youngsters having connection with people of all ages, right? Like the elders and whatnot. But I think, I think it's not just the benefit of talking to somebody and sitting with them who's older. There's also, I think, a benefit of talking to somebody who's not American, like talking mm -hmm. to a, talking yeah. to somebody from another country mm -hmm. and appreciating people who are from somewhere else like and, and, and Absolutely. not feeling disconnected from them. Absolutely. And then that enables the youngsters to actually go to a, maybe a masjid that they don't, that is full of immigrants, for example, and still feel at home mm -hmm. and not feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's a like but super critical thing uh, to kind of bind, like again, binding them into their faith and community, but not this, just not just age, yeah. but also culture. No, but, but but think about for us growing up, it was our grandparents who represented that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were they lived with us in some cases, or they visited us for uh, long periods of time. They represented the foreign. Mm -hmm. they, they were the they remnants were, of a generation. They were the remnants of a generation, and although our parents are now our children's grandparents, our parents are so. Americanized, mm. having lived in America longer than they lived back home, mm -hmm. that in many ways they are, I mean, you know, they, they have the trappings of Hyderabad yeah. and the Muslim world, wherever they may come from. But by and large, right. their mindset, the way they interact with our, our children, i.e. their grandchildren, is mm. very American. Mm. It's, it's not the way you interacted with your dadima. Right. The way you, the way your daughter interacts with your mother is very different than the way you interact with your dadima. Mm. I mean, we have jokes in the family about you didn't you, like your. It was a little rusty, but you had to converse with your grandmother. Right, you right. were forced to, yeah. mm. and she didn't speak to you in English. Right. Mm. What is your mom talking to your daughter? In? Pure mm. English. Yeah. Mm. So you know, I think that's what's also changed. Allah help us. Yeah. So it just Our reminded preference. me, you know, like in uh, in Indo Pak culture, when you sit at the dinner table you eat with your hands mostly, right? And so you eat with your hands and, and by the time you don't want the, you don't want to get up from the conversation because it's so engrossing and it's so, and you, but you, and you realize that you're never, even just if, if you get up, wash your hands and resume in the living room, it's it not going to be the same. Be the same. Yeah. So people literally, you know, there's like this thing where you, your, your food is like all crusty and stuff on your hands and, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's just, Subhanallah. because you're just sitting there and you want to marinate in just, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, Subhanallah. 
Yeah. Anyway, so should we, I'm thinking we, of that as these yeah. these recordings tend to be that way. Yeah, I'm sure. So so you finish up at Azhar in, tw- uh, in 2011, around the time of the revolution, you come back. How what, what do you find waiting back in America after seven years away? And presumably, uh, you know, I think we were joking about this uh, in the pa- in a previous conversation. You can't, as an Azhar graduate, you can't go to LinkedIn and, and search for jobs under that profile, right? It's it's yeah. it's a bit of a, uh, you kind of have to come in and, and make make something of your own. How, how does that play out? Yeah. And and I know, again, speaking back to the earlier conversation we had, I remember your experiences were a little different than, than Sheikh al-Muslim was. Like mm-hmm. in terms of what's waiting back home, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. different for men versus women. Yeah, yeah. not a whole lot of positions for women yeah. and our uh, you know women teachers at least at that time i think there's starting to be a little bit of a shift people are understanding that yeah. a lot of what a religious director does is not gender specific other than leading salah obviously in khutbas but that's not what takes up most of your time and uh anyways yeah, yeah. so i mean i don't know we, when we went to study one of our big issues was that we wanted to understand our religion and then we wanted to serve the community and so every year when we would come back in the summer, we would work on different things in the community uh, as volunteers, obviously. Maybe that's not obvious anymore, but as volunteers, it's part of how you learn. It's part of how you, <laughs> everyone wants to get paid for everything now. It's like, you no, know, you don't get paid for that. You got to get your dues, you know, put your work in. So we used to come every summer and uh, teach classes and do seminars and stuff like that. Actually, we found some of the old ones recently and I was amazed. I was like, subhanAllah, I can't, like we taught that 15 years ago now. That's crazy. But that's uh so we would do that every summer so in doing that we would have relationships with different people and we kind of like stayed close to the people who were on the ground in the masajid and like we we knew our community in a sense Mm -hmm. and we were also kind of like early people back uh so so we knew which masajid were hiring we knew which organizations are hiring and we were starting to have those conversations from before you know, and who, those relationships from before. So, alhamdulillah, it worked out. Who are some of the thought leaders that either were people who were on your radar prior to Azhar or they became, they, they came on your radar while you were overseas? And did you connect with them in the United States? I know we've talked about That's like Dr. Question. Jackson, for example. Mm-hmm. We've also talked about Dr. Omar. I mean, these are specifically people we've named. Yeah. Uh, and then also, of course, people in your own local community. I mean, at that time, you know, uh, Dr. Mozama Siddiqui was, you know, is there, and I think Dr. Uh, Ahmed Sucker was still there. So yeah. I'm just curious, like, if there were people who also kind of were helped you inform what was happening in the community here in the United States while yeah. you were while you were gone. I mean, to be honest, uh, Imam Soheib was there when we were there, so you know he was one of those people. But again, we were always. Like we were very involved with mass at that time and MSAs. And so we were always connected to people on the ground. Okay. So we kind of felt like we understood what was going on. Got it. Yeah, there's a level of transition that has to happen. And sure. you don't want to jump the gun when you come back and so on and so forth. But like we kind of understood what was yeah. going on. And these are conversations we were always having together amongst the students, especially with Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. We would have these conversations all the time. You know, what's going on in your community? What's going on in our community? What kind of issues are people facing? Like we were talking about these things all the time when we were in Egypt. And so when we came back, it was kind of like we just plugged in and started working. And, uh, you know, there were the people who came through while we were, Dr. Yasser Qadi came, used to come through every so often when we were in Cairo. Oh. So we met him a couple of times when we were in Cairo. Um, and then Dr. Jackson used to come all the time. So we used to, you know, read his works and kind of like follow what's going on with him. Of course, Obey the Law was with us. So like we had that, you know, someone who's very close with him. And then uh, Dr. Omar's writings, I, I came across at that time when we were studying too, his Oasis, the... Uh, the um, Cultural Imperative. Uh, yeah, those papers, the... Uh, what was it called? Noe Foundation. Noe Foundation papers. The Noe Foundation papers I came across when we were studying. So those people are kind of like on our radar, but they weren't... Yeah, you know, we found... We, we came across Tet Leaf while we were studying mm. and kind of like those early videos that Usama had made, Allah Hamu, about... Um, just like community and culture and these third kind space. of things, third yeah, space. Yeah. And so that all of that stuff, cause we were, we were like, we considered ourselves like students of Islam in America. 
Like we're here studying so that we can serve Islam in America. Yeah. So we have to understand Islam in America. That was right. So, you know, we were just, uh, alhamdulillah. Was your goal person. always to move back to uh, Southern California? Always. Okay. Yeah, always. Because our families were there. Yeah. Mm. Our families are in Southern California. And we felt some level of guilt leaving them for so long. You know, I was away at college and then I was away in Egypt. Like, I was away from my family for, uh, I guess, the better part of 10 or 11 years. Mm. And, and just by your children's ages, you had, you, you you didn't have any children no, while you we were, had children when we came yeah, back. Yeah, when you came back, yeah. right. <laughs> so we were we wanted to, if we could, live close to family when we came back, and so Alhamdulillah that worked out. And uh, we had a great cohort of people also. Like there were over these last in our generation, in the couple years after us, between men and women, there's easily over 20 people who were from Southern California who went overseas and studied and came back. Mm. And most of us knew each other either directly or one, one degree apart through MSAs and stuff like that. We all knew each other. So we were always talking to each other. We were always, we have this like Ramadan, every every year in Ramadan, we'd have this iftar that was like the student, the overseas tulab would have uh, suhoor together. Sorry, it was like one night we would spend the whole night together and talk about issues of community and then we'd have suhoor and we'd pray. You know, it was like we had these different traditions that we would do. So, alhamdulillah. We, are, are, are you, and I ask this because I actually met a small cohort while I was there uh, of Azharis, of, of students who are at, at studying at Al-Azhar. Uh, um, Al um, are you in touch with any students that are right now there? Okay. No. Okay. I wish I was. I'd love to talk to you about some of that. I mean, yeah. we can take it off, I, off I wish, mic. I but. wish I was. And, okay. And I think it would be, they, uh, they don't have to be in touch with me, but I think that if any of them hear this, uh, it's really important that you're in touch with people who did what you were doing. Because there's a lot of mistakes that can be made and... Um, they can be easily avoided just by simple yeah. conversations. And so I hope that, I actually for years I've been regretting this. I'm like, listen, I understand if nobody wants to talk to me, like I wouldn't want to talk to me either if I was you because you look at me and you're like, well, you're not really a student and like he didn't do this. Like, okay, no, like, no, I get anyway. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Really, like I, I get, but like then, and I don't, I'm not taking surveys, but like if you're not going to talk to me, at least talk to Sheikh Yasser, talk to Sheikh Arsalan, talk happened. to someone, yeah. you know, so, someone who went to Azhar and like is on the ground now. But there's definitely, because with the revolution, there was definitely a disconnect. Yeah, there is. Like our... When we got in, there's a, it's a whole process to figure out how to get into Azhar. We systematized the entire thing. Wow! In because our in our year, it's so ubiquitous. We had layer, all of the all of the previous exams, amorphous. all of the notes for them. Wow! All of the prep exams, all of the third year exams. Every we had a huge file that when the next year wanted to come, we could we literally had a briefcase. We handed it to them. We told them, "This is you guys now. It's on you." use this and then you give it to the next and that happened for several years and then i don't know what happened to it i can actually see it in my eyes i could see the the folder that we had no, that and, was uh, again this, i don't the know what happened brief you know? time that i spent with them i impressed upon them exactly what you did which is or what you said which is getting in touch with people who've done exactly what you're doing right now and avoiding the pitfalls and seeking out the you know what worked Mm -hmm. and, and, and especially so, in Egypt, because in Egypt, yeah. it's really easy to get into like a little pocket of ideas and you can't escape from it. And that's actually the worst thing you can do in Egypt, because Egypt is a place where you don't have to do that. It's actually one place where you can expose to every group, expose to every scholar, expose to every perspective, and you should benefit from that. But then sometimes you see students who get like stuck in a little pocket yeah. and they don't get out of it. And you're like, subhanAllah, what a waste. So, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you come back to the U, and yeah. so you, as when you come back, it's 2012. You have various uh, roles you play: resident scholar, university chaplain, Islamic studies teacher. All that leads to the the co the co founding with your uh, wife Sheikh Muslima of the Majlis. I'd love or for you, I'd love for you to share some of those experiences, especially in light of number one. The changes you saw after being away from America for mm. a good part of seven years, and then also in light of like the rapid acceleration of change in general that we're seeing with social media yeah. um, that continued and accelerated through COVID and in recent years. Yeah. And, and we've been talking a little Crazy. about that, but I'd love for you to share your experiences and, and the work you're doing and how it's evolved with all that change right. happening. Because I, I mean, I would say again, just as someone, uh, as a consumer purely, oh, well, I mean, Talif being an anomaly in the sense that I was involved more than just as a consumer, 
is that I would say one of the changes that happened while you were gone is the con uh, the conflagration of, of, of spaces like Tetlif. Uh, of uh, that, that was something relatively new, and that was something that was that 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 had happened. I think right in that period that you're describing. Yeah. But I feel like when we came yeah. back, it was still Tet Leaf was pretty much the only one. Mm. You that know, that yeah, that was starting right. to pick up. I see. But you're right. we were still like yeah. on the yeah. cusp of it. Right. So I would love to kind of, in, you know, in addition to Omar's question, sort of piggybacking on that, is is that is the idea of. How much does modeling mudgeless become a exercise in, you know, looking at other communities that had done similar work? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me try to. So one of the, I think the starting point in this is that I believe that we were probably the. I, I'm pretty confident we were basically the last generation of students overseas before smartphones. Huh. Because they had picked up here by the time we finished, but not there. The infrastructure there wasn't really strong enough to make a smartphone very useful. That's true. It's, it was yeah. still, most people were still on like dial-up phone or whatever those analog phones. Um, so we were like the last generation of students before all of that stuff went insane. You know, where you really had to find the dars, you had to listen to it. The recordings were like recordings people passed to each other. There was nothing on YouTube. It, it was a different world. So, so we left like when that starts. And we start going the community, become imam. And after a couple of years as an imam, going to be a chaplain. And then towards the end of the chaplain thing, transitioning into the majlis work and into working in schools too, because that was kind of like, honestly, the most controllable job I can have that allows me to have a job and do what I want to do, nice. which, is, which is the majlis stuff. Um, until until and if that's ever sustainable for for me and my family, but sure. that's um, how do how I mean a lot has happened in the last <laughs> in the last ten years. A yeah. lot has happened in terms yeah. of the just cultural landscape. Yeah, and I'm, but, I'm just imagining like scholars uh, essentially teaching and and seeing people on their phone. Like that's a, that in and of itself is just a small example of right. a shift, right? Alhamdulillah that I'm I'm in the in the majlis. We're so blessed. We have such a beautiful community and we have people who like really want to be there. People who are really serious. It was so beautiful, so polite, so so welcoming, so really wanting to learn. Um, and it's like, like, it's like having a big family, which is always what we wanted actually in our community work. Um, so like, I'm curious then in your estimation, what function does and, and you can speak about majlis, obviously, specifically, or just on a broader level, uh, spaces like uh, majlis. What do they offer the community that, in your estimation, was lacking or deficient, yeah. Yeah. if not lacking? Well, it's actually not what a lot of people probably think it is. Um, to us, the big thing that the majlis is is it's an institution where religious teachers are actually in charge. That's actually what it is. Yeah, people look at it as a, as a third space, it's more welcoming, it's more this and that and so on and so forth. But that's because religious teachers are actually in charge. <laughs> versus being employed. Is that versus being employed. Okay. Yeah. Versus, versus being subject to the cultural tendencies and whims of attendees or management. Mm. And, and that the religious teachers understand that part of actually understanding the religion is putting it into the context that it's happening in. So if you don't respect the local culture, you're not doing Islam. Mm. That's, that is Islam. Mm. So doing Islam in Southern California is not making it Egypt. I would love to make it Egypt sometimes, but it's, it's not. It's Southern California. And... I understand that, Sheikh Fuad understands that, my wife understands that, and you know that's, that informs what we do. When it comes to how we expect people to behave in a space and what we tell them about that, we make that very clear to them. You know, like, this is the way that you're supposed to be. This is, it's not just you come here and you do whatever you feel like. It's, it's not going to work that way. You come here and there's some sort of guidance that you're supposed to be taking. And if you don't want to get on board with that, that's perfectly fine. I still love you, uh, visit you, 
We can have dinner together. We can do whatever, you, you know, whatever. However we can help you, we're going to help you. But this is an institution that is supposed to be a reflection of what we're teaching. So what is it meant to be really is it's meant to be truly grounded in a, in a sound understanding of the tradition, which is deeply knowledgeable at the same time, deeply connected to reality and context and what people are going through and so on and so forth. And that we are supposed to be like that and the space is supposed to reflect that. And, and that's what we're supposed to do as a community. I think that a lot of times we end up doing everything else. And, and, you know, our goal is not to have a prayer space. Prayer is wonderful, but it's, it's not our actual goal. And which ties to another issue. Which is that I think that, and maybe someone will, I'm hoping someone one day will pick up on this point, is that I think Islam in America, you know, if we step, take a step back, we have two major fard kifaya, two major communal obligations. One of them is you have somewhere to pray and gather. One of them that's even before somewhere to pray is that you have people who can teach people Islam. And the Prophet them was with the people in Mecca before there was ever a masjid in Medina. Mm -hmm. And the first priority of the community actually is to fulfill this obligation. It's not to figure out somewhere to pray. And this is, I think, one of our big problems. Um, and mm -hmm. so one of our, our goal is not necessarily to have somewhere where just anyone in the community can pray Esha if they feel like it. Our goal is to have somewhere where religious teachers can independently function in their service of the community. And that's why, from alhamdulillah, you know, we were blessed to have Sheikh Fuad in our community and to kind of get to know him over these last years, and alhamdulillah, you know. But that's really what we're trying to do. And we believe that everything else that we need to do will kind of grow out of that. Okay. Islam, so, Islam passes on when you're actually teaching and passing that knowledge and inspiring like the next generation versus building something that maybe the youngsters aren't even going to, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a lived tradition. Yeah. Not, it's a that, lived, not to say yeah. that the second yeah. thing is important, yeah. but you're talking about what comes first. Masajid are wonderful. I love masajid. Yeah. Right. You know, if, uh, I would, if I had the time to do it, I would be in the masjid every single day. I right. have no problem, right? Yeah. And I love the masajid and all of their diversity and all of their insanity. <laughs> but sometimes, not sometimes, like we have to actually provide a direction for people that this is what this religion is and this is the direct this is how you can do it mm -hmm. and these are various models for what that might look like yeah. this is what community is supposed to provide um but if it's just a kind of like a free-for-all and we're at this we're at the we're subject to the whims of of donors and we're subject to the whims of people's feelings all the time and like i'm not saying that we don't that's not important obviously we care about people's feelings you know but it can't be that things are made so haphazardly you know and, and so alhamdulillah you know yeah. we're trying to do this but so in the, the end we just want, in the, the end what it comes yeah. down to we just want to serve community yeah. yeah and we're trying to build institutions that will allow us to do that and, and the majlis no. isn't is without in, being like this traveling person and, and i understand people i'm not judging anyone people do things for various reasons but like for me personally local community is very important yeah i want relationships with people and i want to know them and i want my kids to know them i want my family to know them i want i want to see them i want even the places i travel to i I like to travel to places that I go to regularly so I can have relationships mm, that, yeah. that develop. I don't like to just pop in and leave. Yeah. And, and the Majlis is San Diego and, and Irvine, is that right? Yeah. San okay. Diego and, and right now, yeah. I think I, th I think you nailed something there in that last comment as well. I think that's something that we've seen shift or hopefully, and I, I would, if it is broader than just you and others that you know, where the, 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 the speaker getting on a plane every weekend and going to some community and fundraising or giving a workshop or giving a lecture um, and not really creating sustainable long-term relationships with those communities, hopefully that model, as beneficial as it was, I mean, being a product of it or a recipient of it mm -hmm. uh, and a consumer of it, frankly, uh, living in Texas, uh, you know, I don't know where I would have been had it not been for people who came from other communities and, for sure. and, and gave us those. For sure. But anyway... You know, I, ho hopefully that model is changing to more of a localized, uh, paro like, and parochial is not a pejorative, but like localized kind of um, setting. Not to push back, but to maybe offer, or how would you respond to the skeptic? Okay. Who would then say that, what about checks and balances? I, I, mm -hmm. I love it. I love, you know, yes, you know, you have an organization that's run and administrated by shuyuk, by religious mm -hmm. teachers. Where are the checks and balances? Because 100%. all too often we've seen 
where that model can. 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So I can say what we try to do. Okay. What we try to do is we try to make sure people understand who our teachers are in case they have an issue with us, they can take it to them. Uh, we try to have more than one teacher. So, you know, alhamdulillah, there's, there's myself, there's my wife, there's Sheikh Fuad. Yes, we're close and everything, but at least there's more than one. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we always tell people in our community is like, if people come and they're like, we want to be part of this, we, we always tell them something very simple. We tell them, all you have to do is start coming. And once you start coming, just come and understand what we're teaching, understand what we're talking about, understand how we're looking at things. And as you do that, then you can start to help with simple things. You can help prepare, prepare, prepare the food, serve food, prepare drinks, check on people, greet people, stuff like this, 100%. And as you do that, you'll become closer and closer in the community and you'll understand what we're trying to do and you'll understand how we look at things, which includes, you can tell me if you think that I'm wrong. And... And once you have that really baseline kind of like we're on the same page, uh, for, for sure, 100%. Like, you've been coming and you've been learning from me. I'm not teaching you so that you can worship me. I'm teaching you so that you can stand on your own two feet in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which would mean that you'll be like the Sahaba were, which is that Abu Dhar has his understanding of the religion from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not that, I mean, obviously, you know. There's a difference. But the Sahaba were comfortable to argue with each other if they needed to, right. to differ with each other if they needed to, because they knew we're going back to the same source. Mm. So we, we come together and we study every single week. So now we should be on the same page. You know this is right and this is wrong. If you see me do something that's wrong, you should be stopping me. And you should be telling people and you should be engaging with it and you should be talking to me and talking to whoever you need to do. So we're, you know, I, I Now think when you say you, you mean the community at Community large. member, Okay, yeah. not just your fellow uh, right. teachers. Right, no, the community yeah. members. Okay. okay, We have people, alhamdulillah, and I, you know, some of them actually predate to, to the time when I was an imam. But even from the time of the majlis, we have people that have been regulars in the majlis for the last six years. So I expect those people to have enough confidence in their understanding of the religion to be able to say like, I differ with you on this. And I know that you guys want to do it this way, but maybe we should consider doing it this way. And there should be able to, yeah. and that should be part of community. Like we're not, and anyone who comes, they know, you know, you know when you go into somewhere and someone's sitting on the chair, like they're on a throne. Yeah. And you know, when you come into somewhere and someone's sitting on their chair, like, all of us are together and we all love each other and we're all family. And like, so that's the, I always tell people like, uh, the main thing that we want at the Majlis is we want it to be like a family. You're going to have family members you agree with. You're going to have family members you don't agree with. You're going to have family members with different personalities and so on and so forth. We don't want this like over the top tekelluf adab type thing, like extreme adab going on that makes it so that people don't know how, they can't talk to each other, they can't say anything. No, I want you, you know. Yeah. Sometimes people still are shy and things like that, but right. at least we're pushing that. There's um, shyness, but I think like conversely, when you see models that go awry, it's not always the fault of the, of the a charismatic personality. It's true. Or the religious scholar, let's say. Sometimes it's just, it's that's the way, like, it comes from the bottom or top. Yeah, it sure. comes from the bottom up, meaning that people, whether, you know, you, yeah, you come into a space and the person sitting there on a pedestal or, or you know, what have you. But uh, even despite the best intentions of that person, um, the people attending can raise or elevate a person in their minds Definitely. and in the way they interact. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical. I, I guess I'm just trying to share out loud what what we can do to devise like best practices mm -hmm. for the for for our community in general to mm -hmm. avoid mm -hmm. some of those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. and I don't know the answer. I'm just yeah. Yeah. thinking with someone who who yeah. runs a place like that. And I know this question. is top of mind for you. So it's an important you know, question. Yeah. Let me ask you uh, as a maybe as we begin to wrap then um, because I'd love for you to also uh, let our listeners know how they can engage Majlis if they don't live in Southern California. Number one, is is it is it a problem that you run into that you 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 find that your benefactors and your beneficiaries are not the same people? 
And by that, I you mean the people, that yeah, sure, me. sure, sure. <laughs> the people that are attending Majlis, okay. right? And, and are your supporters. Okay. Um, uh, and by supporters, I mean your financial mm -hmm. backing. Mm -hmm. Is it coming from the community or do you find that there's this disconnect? Because again, just speaking from experience or anecdotally from other uh, organizations that may or may not have been mentioned uh, already on this episode, there is a disconnect between the benefactors and the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Those who are attending regularly mm -hmm. and, and, and attending the content mm -hmm. or, and benefiting from it are different than the people writing the checks. At That's the end of the day. not really the case for us. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. That's a sustainable model. Yours. Yeah. Are, is, is it an issue because it's not sustainable, or is, or is there some deeper issue, a problem, concern? So I guess you it, could say it's it's uh, you know we can get. I mean, this is almost just a separate really quick. Podcast. Yeah. Just yeah, real yeah. quick. I think I think there's a. What did you ask? Sorry. So so I'm just wondering yeah. if the beneficiary and the benef and the benefactor are different. Obviously, the main issue is it's not sustainable because they're they're not like literally the right. the person writing check could decide not to, right. and, and it has nothing yeah. to do with whether they're interested in the programming or not. So per I, se. yeah, so but, there is but, that. But then, is there a deeper issue in terms of like the health of an organization? Yeah, beyond so I think finances? sustainability is an issue certainly, and that's obvious. But the other thing I think goes to what you mentioned earlier, Sheikh Jamal, which is how. Um, the kind of feedback loop that you were talking about with the people that attend. Mm. I think that when you have a, like a, like where the Venn diagram doesn't meet with regards to your benefactors and beneficiaries, then that accountability goes away, then kind of meeting your community where, where the needs are goes away because again, mm. it's very different. You, you're, you're, you're kind of beholden to the people writing the checks, um, but at the same time, you're catering to an audience who are not those people. Mm -hmm. I think the way you avoid mm -hmm. that from both the sustainability uh, uh, point of view, but also from a health of the organization hmm. is where that Venn diagram is a full circle hmm. in terms of benefactors and hmm. beneficiaries. Yeah, this is a big discussion. Yeah. <laughs> if anything, if I'm even planting an, an idea that yeah, you take. can cultivate and you can germ, you know, if I'm just even germinating yeah. a, a seed, uh, I, you know, I, I'll be happy because I think it is something that is important for organizations to think so, about. So, you know, the way we started was that Essentially, there was there was no budget for okay. probably two years. There was basically no budget. We were meeting in people's homes. We would rent spaces and like sell tickets to the event that would cover the cost of the event. It was pretty much like, and and then at some point we felt like okay, enough people are starting to come now that we can say, hey, we want to open a space. What do you guys think? Let's do a little fundraiser, and people supported it. Alhamdulillah. And so we, we got a space and there started to be some level of pay involved for certain individuals. Um, and I feel like pretty much we've grown very organically over the last six, seven years, um, slowly getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And yeah, I mean, what we always tell the community is that, you see, these money issues are very tricky. Um, what we try to remind people is that as a general rule, if you feel that you are benefiting from something and you feel that something is important for you and for your family, you should support it. And, you know, you guys know what things cost. We don't have to explain that to you. You do budgets for your families, for your homes, everything else. Right. I don't have to explain that to you. Yeah. You understand. Right. So just, you know, what you can do is what you can do. And we'll tell you what the numbers are. And you'll see, like, how much who's working and who's not. And if we have other jobs and other things, like, everyone understands, yeah. you know. But it's important to us that our um, regular attendees do support. And uh, at the same time, I'm not against big benefactors. You know, if someone comes and says, we want to give you this building, you say, alhamdulillah, right. you know, thank right. you. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, yeah. but I think, yeah, there's... Because I think in the mind of the modern, like going back to things we've already touched on in the past um, or in the conversation we've had, you know, the modern consumer, there's a, there's a mindset where they value what they're paying for as yeah. opposed to like something they're getting for free. Yeah. Right. So I think that, you know... Yeah, this is a big topic. Yeah, I know. Because... <laughs> I don't even like to think about community members as consumers. No, you're right. And, no, no, you're and, yeah, and my, I'm sorry. I was and, giving, trying to give a crude, No, no, I understand. Yeah. Like, it's not, yeah, I'm not trying analogy. to criticize your, yeah. your point. It's totally understandable. Yeah. But I, I feel like these topics, actually, there's a lot of teasing out of things here that needs to be That's all I'm done, trying, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because historically speaking, there are no donors for religious institutions. 
in the sense that yeah. if you're a religious teacher, you are not getting money from a donor. You are getting money from an established trust. An endowment. An endowment yeah, that, is, that is stable and you are there to do a particular job and that's what you're accountable for. Yeah. And usually you're accountable to your peers mm. because they're the ones who manage the alqaf. Like in the Azhar system, you're going to be held accountable by the Azhari shiuch that are above you. They understand exactly what your job is. They understand exactly what you should be doing and they know exactly if you're not doing it or not. And the people know who to complain to if they feel like you're not doing your job. So I think the checks and balances were understood even without the donor part of it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and I actually prefer it that way. Um, the reality is that, I mean, I miss the times actually in Majlis where I taught in Majlis and I wasn't paid for it. I miss those times because that's the best. The best is when you can teach someone and, and you can not be asking anything from them and they know that too. Because it changes the way they engage with it. Mm. But the reality is that we can't do it if like, yeah. you know, you don't have the time to do the work. You don't have the time to do the work. So so Anyways. maybe as we wrap, um, I'll ask a, a, a last question unless Pervez, you have one. But my, my final question would just be, you know, coming out of COVID and seeing the organization uh, grow, people coming back into community. I, I've certainly seen a big kind of uh, reemergence of community and, and community activity, even in the Bay Area here uh, in the last, you know, 18 months or whatever, uh, maybe since two Ramadans ago. Mm -hmm. But what, what excites you the most? Um, uh, whether it's something you're seeing in community or about, about the organization, that's maybe mm -hmm. a good place to end. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I would also ask you to uh, tell our listeners where they can find your content and 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 support a much sure. the work that much is doing. Sure, so yeah. as you answer Omar's question, yeah. Omar's question. I mean, uh, it's nice to just see things coming back to life, mm -hmm. and I and I think that there's tremendous good. Always, 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 there's tremendous good in the Ummah of Al Habib sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there's tremendous good in our people. And there is tremendous good in our communities. There's tremendous good in Islam in the West. We we talk about the difficulties we have and the challenges we have only out of love and only out of trying to do better and better. But the reality is that there is a lot of good. And so, you know, what makes me interested or excited or whatever is just to have the opportunity to continue to try to do this work. To, to help people and to serve people and to be with people and to try to be part of. I, I believe 100% that Islam is coming back and has been coming back and will be coming back in a major way in our lifetimes. And my hope is just like whatever small piece of that we can play a part in, then we play a part in it. That's that's it, alhamdulillah. And, um, you know, if the majlis is, is, is a seed, is like a drop in that ocean, then it's a drop in that ocean. And, uh, you know, that's all we really, we're all just hoping to be a drop in the ocean of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam send them in the end. So, alhamdulillah. People can go to, in terms of where to find us and stuff, yeah. look for the Majlis online. You'll find it, find it on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. There's almost all of our public classes are online. H huge amount of content. Uh, all, all of the Shema and the Tirmidhi, all of the Hikm of Ibn Atta'ala, full series on the Sirah is still in progress. Uh, deliverer from error of Imam al-Ghazali, the beginning of guidance of Imam al-Ghazali, tafsir of the last three juz of the Qur'an. Uh, I mean, there's a huge amount of content we have online. And then also we've started recently a seminary that's like a two-year self-paced online uh, seminary. So mm. we're rolling it out slowly. We've done two terms now. We're going to be starting the third term in uh, in March. Inshallah, we've had, alhamdulillah, good good feedback so far and yeah. we're hoping to continue that inshallah. and people can register wherever they are and yeah. and and do it online yeah it's completely online and it's completely self-paced it's actually we're calling it a seminary but it's actually it's not meant to make you a scholar in case someone is thinking about that it's it's too uh, we called it the ennis ibn malik community servants program and the idea was that we need people who can serve community and be in the lives of other people with some certain foundations of their understanding of the religion and the program is meant to give them that Thank you so much. You've been more than generous with your time, mm -hmm. as always. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. I mean, we could do this for hours. And again, going back to something we mentioned uh, earlier, you know, uh, we want to have you back on, but, uh, you know, you touch on, there, there's certain touch points in a conversation that are hard to replicate, but I hope that inshallah, when we do have you back on, we can, uh, we can delve into some of these more broader conversations that we just teased. 
a little bit. Inshallah. 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 Thank you for having me. No, thank you. And uh, as always, uh, listeners, uh, you can uh, reach out to us if you with feedback, with questions, with comments at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can find us on all social media channels. So check out all of our socials. We're even on TikTok now. So go and check out segments uh, that are available on various social media platforms. And as always, check us out on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. <laughs>